Touched by. Come on, ref. Come on, by Virgin. Come on, ref. Come on, ref. By Virgin. Let's turn the crowd upside down. By the sun. I think that big fella intends to sit down with that chair. Checking out Breakfast Super Raw. Bon appetit! As Don, Tony, and Miss dish out their opinions about the world of pro wrestling, sports, news, and pop culture. Breakfast Soup Raw. And now, your host, Miss and Don Tony. Okay, that was a botch. I admitted it was a botch. That's what happens when I uh, forgot to configure, you know, just the chair shot that made me throw up a whole bunch of times. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Monday night, Breakfast Soup Raw, June 21st, 2021, 62121. 21. I am Don Tony. He is. Anthony Missionary Thomas, how's it going, DT? Ah, not too bad, not too bad. By the way, this is a drink. This is not like any like sex toy. I don't know. For some reason, half it's only, when it's only half on the screen, it looks a little perverted. I know we were going to cosplay Nia Jax and Alexa Bliss today, but you know we really didn't get the same uh, voodoo as we got yesterday. But Mish, uh, yes. I'm telling you, man, I, you couldn't have Eva Marie and Alexa Bliss both in Money in a Bank. You know, I, I mean, because there was two ways you could have gone with this. Eva Marie could have gotten into Money in a Bank and four weeks go by and she has done nothing in the ring, does nothing at Money in a Bank, and at the very end when everybody's laid out, she climbs to the top and gets the briefcase. And she ends up on Raw for six weeks straight Gets the briefcase and never wrestled a minute in the match. That's one way you could have gone. The second way you could have gone is Alexa Bliss is in Money in the Bank. And then you could picture Asuka climbing the ladder, about to grab the briefcase. And Alexa Bliss climbs up also. And Alexa Bliss looking at Asuka. Asuka's in a trance. She's and everybody grab the briefcase, grab your me. And Oscar's in a trance, and then either Alexa Bliss could go, and Oscar f falls and takes a dive untouched, and Alexa Bliss grabs the briefcase. The reason why I would go with option two is because at least Alexa Bliss could wrestle a little bit. It's pretty obvious achoo, that uh, Eva Marie is there for trolling purposes. The big question yeah. is. Does it feel like even Marie's in there for the long haul? It doesn't feel that way to me. No. I mean, you, you give her four weeks of a buildup, and then after a week, after one match, you already dissolve the partnership with herself and what's her name? Dewdrop? No, you just got to do it like Beastie Boys Intergalactic. And, you know, dude, no, Dewdrop. Um, no, it's mm, drop. It's do drop like Beastie Boys. You remember Beastie Boys? Oh, I, I am known to do Boys. the flop. Oh, no, it's I am Dude, known uh, to do the wop. Also known as the Flintstone flop. Eva Marie getting biz on the grop. Breakfast soup known to let the beat do drop. Epic fail. Uh, Epic fail. 
Epic fail. If I would have put a beat to it, it probably would have sounded better. I look like Stewie from Family Guy when I do that. You know, can we, can we please, Dad? Can we please? Horrible, horrible fucking end to this. Hor horrible blow. I don't like, think it's I, over. I, well, where, where are they going to go with it? They're going to have Eva Marie versus Dewdrop. No, I so. think next week there'll be some miscommunication and Eva Marie will walk a little bit of a, a finer line with Dewdrop. And um, they got three weeks before live fans return. So they got yeah. three weeks to try to turn this chicken shit into chicken salad that still smells, smells like chicken shit, tastes like chicken shit, but maybe you think for a minute it's not chicken shit. I don't I, know how they can save this, dude. I really don't. I mean, <laughs> the, the only thing I could come up with that made any kind of fucking sense is something that WWE would never do in a million years. And that would be to make Piper Nevin embarrass Eva Marie because she's a diva. And we know for a fact that WWE doesn't want to highlight the fact that some of the girls on the roster don't wrestle. And they're just there to look good. So the idea of that actually being a storyline to me would be like, oh, that's pretty fucking cool. It's pretty fucking cool that Eva Marie is over here making fun of Piper Nevin and calling her Dewdrop and shit like that. But in the reality, we know that fucking Piper Nevin can wrestle. We know that Piper Nevin can absolutely be a positive fucking force on WWE Raw, especially in the women's division. But they won't do that. So what's the blow off here? Now that we've seen this crap that they're doing tonight, what's the blow-off? They're going to have Eva Marie and Piper Nevin. Probably, you're right, there's probably going to be another miscommunique. She's going to apologize next week, but this time Eva Marie is going to leave Piper Nevin out to dry. Or, Absolutely. Or drop, teardrop, whatever. <laughs> and Dude, you're going to go from there to eventually, what, a, a feud? Like already? That is just the most asinine thing ever. Because they've already, in one week, they've already established that Piper Nevin just doesn't like Eva Marie. And this do drop name, I hope this shit doesn't stick. That's horrible. That is fucking atrocious. <laughs> I know. Uh, what do you think about my uh, thoughts on Alexa Bliss winning money in the bank due to voodoo? Seems like that might be where they're going. Although I was more concerned tonight, not necessarily with Alexa Bliss. Uh, are we talking about this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a little concerned with that. A <laughs> little, little concerned. Look, uh, I love Nikki Cross. I think Nikki Cross absolutely has been garnering favor from the audience lately. Uh, having her come out there as butterfly superhero is, is not something I think anybody expected. I don't think it looks endearing on her. And the fact that she was with Alexa Bliss tonight makes her even look more of an idiot. I I don't know. They Do they just really hate the fans? Does WWE just find enjoyment from hating the fans? Because you look at it from a business perspective, DT, what is the business choice in this? What is getting over with the crowd? Did the crowd ask for this? We don't Did know. The crowd, you know what WWE is missing? A female superhero. Now, don't get me wrong. In that same vein... I made the complaints last night when myself and Joey were doing the coverage of Heck in a Box. And I said the biggest problem with a lot of the female talents, especially last night, was it was very difficult to determine who was babyface and heel. And I think a lot of the reason is, is because the gimmicks and the characters that these women play aren't very clear. So you'll have Rhea doing, coming out as a babyface but doing heel shit. You'll have Charlotte doing heel shit, but then at the same time getting cheered for it. You'll have a lot of these women kind of borderlining between both the good guy and the bad guy. And the problem is, is that there's no clear-cut definition. So tonight, they give us Nikki Cross as superhero, as babyface butterfly superhero. And I couldn't think of a worse, a, a worse idea to possibly saddle her with, especially... Because it seemed like her gimmick was underdog. I really had the feeling that Nikki Cross was building the underdog image. And the announcers tonight did the exact same thing that they've previously done. They put her over. Hey, look, she got the win over Charlotte. She got the win on Ray. You know, 
Nikki Cross has a couple of important matches under her belt lately. Like, they were putting her over for this. For this. I don't, I'm, I'm not pleased. I, I, I told she you the last She won tonight again. She won tonight again. Let's, let's be honest. I know we're going to get into the match rundown because that's what we're going to do. But she, she, she beat Shayna. Smoke and mirrors, man. Smoke and mirrors. I remember when Dana Brooke a couple of years ago, she started getting a couple of wins, getting into money in the bank. They're like, oh, she's finally getting a push. Oh, she deserves it. You know, it's, it's my time. It's my, no, it's not. No, it's not. Every year they do this to someone. Give someone a couple of wins. Oh, they get, look, did you see what Meltzer reported yesterday on his Observer? No. But you and I said the entire time with Cesaro leading up to his match against Roman Reigns, our number one concern was that is Cesaro finally going to be utilized as an upper, you know, maybe not necessarily main event all the time, but upper tier, you know, that starts getting some significant wins in this. and Or is the Roman Reigns match simply, all right, you know, loud complainers of the WWE Universe. Yeah, we're still in COVID, and yeah, we're buying time until we get back live fans and we go the road to SummerSlam. So we're going to give you what you want, and here's your Cesaro World Championship match. Now leave us the fuck alone. And you and I said that quite many weeks back then, that once he has his match, which is I even think I said at the night of the pay-per-view, I said, I hope... This isn't the case, but it sure feels like, okay, all right, you got your, you blew your load. You got your main event moment. All right, now we're going to totally throw you a curveball and bring Seth Rollins back out there, which totally takes him away from Roman Reigns, never to be mentioned ever again in the same sentence with Roman Reigns. And then Meltzer says yesterday that Cesaro's push has pretty much come to an end. What fucking push? All right. They do this... Every year, it's smoke and mirrors because they got somebody's got to fill that role. I told said it for three weeks straight. I said, yeah, you know, the fans will get a little bit behind Nikki because she is a baby face, sympathetic. She's very likable, you know. But do you really think? And I think I even think I asked you this question last week. I said, if you know, why hasn't WWE really pushed Nikki Cross before? If they really felt that she could get pushed to the moon. This, I don't think they had anything for her back no, then. I really no. don't. And, I mean, even now, I don't think they had anything for her. This is a complete accident. When Nikki Cross originally came out there, she was supposed to be filler. If anything, it was kind of a favor to her so she wasn't standing and catering. But then people started to eat it up. They liked the idea of Nikki Cross coming back and getting a few wins. They liked the idea that all of a sudden, Nikki Cross, this virtual non-existent wrestler that's been around for a while is now being pushed up against Charlotte and Ray, the two girls that are running raw. So it was unique and it was nice. And it was a good underdog story. And the more and more Ray and Charlotte were diminishing her efforts, the more and more Nikki Cross seemed to become popular. And it, this is yeah. her reward. So now she's got a character. They gave her a gimmick. It's completely embarrassing, and I'm pretty sure the thought process is, well, you should just be happy you're on TV. Please get this over. It's your it's You know what it reminds job. me of? It reminds me of that TV show. I don't think it was Spider-Man back in the day, but there was a TV show. Was it, was it The Greatest American Hero? Where yes. where he actually did a couple of things, and I think in his mind he thought he suddenly had superhero uh, you know, traits about himself. But he really wasn't. Like, he tried to fly and just fell splat on his head. That's what right. this almost feels like. Okay, Nikki Cross got a couple of wins in a row. One was because she lasted, you know, within a minute or two. The second one, I think, was the same. The third, I don't remember what the fuck happened. And now, you know, she thinks, oh, you know, I'm a superhero. This is for everybody that's been, been held back in this set. Now, obviously, that's the character they gave her. But to me, right. this is just smoke and mirrors. It's only a matter of time where, you know, the, this ends up with losses. And then what does this say? You know What's what I mean? At least Mighty Molly, you know, had the hurricane. And, you know, Mighty Molly actually was a damn good talent. And she got pushed. 
too. I mean, Molly was pushed. You'd be surprised at a win-loss record. Nikki right. Cross, though, she is talented, no question. But I never wow. felt in wow. WWE's eyes that they really were going to put any momentum behind her. And, and we also got to understand this. Charlotte, Rhea Ripley, Asuka. Then you look at the SmackDown talent. You know, how is Nikki Cross going to leapfrog those women? Seriously, not, how do you break yeah, through that? When you make the comparison of, like, Mighty Molly, I think the most important thing to remember about Mighty Molly is that she was attached to Shane Helms, right, who, so I said, as hurricane. the hurricane had a fantastic gimmick, was already over and brought Molly in and eventually bought it, brought in Rosie. You know what I mean? Like, these were all a part of that superhero gimmick, and that dynamic worked for that time. This is more along the lines of the Blue Blazer returning gimmick. You know, and I hate to I hate to make that reference, but superhero out of nowhere for no fucking reason. You know what? Like you... Reason for her gimmick. That's the problem. It's like, look, we want the gimmicks. I, I think a lot of people are pro gimmick. They like the gimmicks in wrestling. It works. They can have fun with it. But there has to be a reason. You don't just wrestle as yourself for fucking four weeks yeah. and then one week, oh, I'm gonna decide to be a construction worker that wrestles. Yeah. I Where just... the fuck did that come from? Yeah. Well, it's no longer, I got my family in Scotland. Now it's larvae. Because don't butterflies come from larvae? Now she's got to say, I got my larvae in Scotland. I can't lose. I don't know where the fuck this leads. I mean, I do see it where it leads. I dig a, a Nikki Cross once again. Remember the dumb dog thing that I said way back when? That, you know, like, I, I'm, it's not, I'm not trying to be abusive towards dogs. I love animals. Dogs are my favorites, obviously. Um, but it, it's like a dog, if anybody remembers my analogy, when they were doing the Nikki Cross Alexa stuff, when Alexa just kept belittling Nikki Cross, Nikki Cross was like that dog that the master comes home and the master treats the dog like shit, and no matter how much the, the master treats the dog like shit, the dog still wags, wags the tail and the dog still thinks that the master loves her. Until, uh, you know, Alexa Bliss breaks the coffee mug and everything on the floor, you know, and it's like, you know, Nikki Cross kept falling for it. Then she cut yeah. that promo. I'll never fall for it again. I'll never fall for it again. And then we have the tag match tonight. Guess what? Money in the bank. It'll probably even lead up to money in the bank where we think that Nikki and Lexi have a little bit of a connection and a friendship and Lexi will stab her in the fucking back. And it's going to make the superhero look like super stupid. Stupid mm -hmm. hero. That's right. what it's going to end up. And this is nothing against Nikki Cross. I like Nikki Cross. I, I right. mean, it's, I, she, she obviously is going to take this and make the best of it. But again, I just feel like, you know, exactly the way I felt for the last three weeks. Over the years, every time we saw this coming, you know, and I would say, you know, you know uh, this is just... The 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 uh, job du jour, you know, get a couple of wins, make people think, oh, they have a they have a legitimate shot, and then it the end happens, and it sucks because it recently happened with Cesaro, you know, and Cesaro, you know, should be in in the you know upper tier. I mean, in our eyes, he is, but not in WWE's eyes. Which so, is kind of wild, considering yeah. that Cesaro's done nothing but be a company guy. I once again, Cesaro's another guy. Nobody hears any bad words about him. I don't think he's, you know, a problem in the back. The guy is a, a fantastic talent in the ring. The fans are behind him. I guess you could argue that his look isn't perfect, but the guy's pretty built. Like, I, there's no reason to look at him and say, oh, this guy isn't a superstar. So I'm really not sure. What do you think it possibly is that Vince isn't on board with a guy like Cesaro? It's not, I think a lot of it is timing. I think a lot of it is timing right now. I mean, Roman Reigns, you ain't breaking through that shit unless you are something major special. And I think Big E is one of those people. Um, you know, I, I honestly never thought Seth Rollins was going up against Roman Reigns this summer, which a lot of people reported. Now we're hearing Seth Rollins versus Edge, which kind of makes a hell of a lot more sense. But Cesaro, you know, up until this point, Cesaro was, you know, that one consistent person. You know, above average, above average, 
you know, it, we are alone on this. Real quick, we are alone on this. If you even take a peek at the chat room, too old, too boring. Well, you know, everybody has a right to their opinion. I no, mean, no, no, I get that, but I mean, when you start looking at it, we start analyzing it from our perspective, and you see the common populace talking about it, and it's just a swell of all these negative attributes attached to Cesaro. Maybe we're wrong on this one. Could be. Maybe Cesaro doesn't belong in the main event. Could be. Could be. But, you know, it's not happening. And, you know, look, Nikki Cross doing that gimmick now. All right. I'll tell you the truth. You know, I really was not that dismayed with it because I never thought Nikki Cross was being pushed to the next level. I was just more confused about Alexa Bliss teaming up with her again. Now, Alexa Bliss is now has new music. And, you know, if everyone out there that said that, you know, uh, that uh, what Lily was done, that's not the case. It's not the case. What is happening right now is exactly what Mish and I told you a couple of weeks ago, is that as we get closer to live fans returning, they were going to do some major changes in Alexa Bliss because you could no longer do all that special effects and doing the stuff pre-recorded in the ring. Nobody at Thunderdome could see that, you know, on the right on the left there, doing this, doing that. You know, now they're moving to the psychological part because they can't do the physical part out there. They've tweaked her look a little bit. They've removed the contacts. You know, they've yeah. changed her music. You know, little by little, they're doing all these tweaks because they're preparing her for live fans again and for the summertime. Um, also, The Fiend should be back soon or Bray Wyatt. You know, we we should get both, but we, at minimum, we're going to get Bray Wyatt. So that's why, like I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, and now because we're in June, third week in June, we're only three weeks away, approximately three weeks from live fans. Right. And... Once you have those live fans, everything changes. Yeah. Everything changes. They, you're, it's going to be very difficult for them to pipe in stuff. It's going to be very difficult for them to get away with some of the things they do on TV. I mean, I honestly would love what the crowd reaction would have been if they did the Eva Marie Dewdrop stuff the last two weeks. I would have loved to see what this reaction would have been. But they know that there were things that they were able to do with no live fans in that building. And now they got to really start. You don't want to change it a week before. So you're doing a slow process. And, you know, doing this for Alexa Bliss is a smart idea. I don't like the voodoo stuff. You know, this voodoo stuff is just really, really stupid. I mean, yesterday, you know, do, I compared it to uh, Damian Sandow. It felt more like Damian Sandow with The Miz when The Miz was doing his moves in the ring and Damian Sandow was mimicking it outside the ring. When Alexa right. Bliss went like this and Nia Jax went like this and Alexa went like this, I just said to myself, my God, you know, that goes against everything about wrestling with the exception of The Undertaker. And I thought about it tonight. I said, why doesn't Alexa Bliss just put everybody under a trance in the Money in the Bank match and she just walks up the ladder and grabs the beef case? And I said, holy shit, that's probably what's going to happen. That's probably what's going to happen. You know? And you will get mercilessly booed for that. I don't know about that. You don't, don't think about so? that. Dude, people are barely on board with the Alexa Bliss gimmick as it is. Other than sadists and masochists, really? <laughs> I don't, I, you know, <laughs> like, we still got four weeks. You still got four yep. weeks. I don't think. I don't think people. Okay, so gimmicks are fun. Gimmicks and goofiness and campiness is fun when it's done right. But let's not forget what happened with Alexa Bliss at WrestleMania and how badly that was poo pooed on. Can you imagine if Alexa Bliss walks out there in a Money in the Bank, just puts everybody under a trance, walks up the fucking ladder, grabs the? the well, he's not going to put. Her. She, she, she's just going to put. The last person that's supposed to get the briefcase. Well, I, I that's that's the way no, I see it. But even doing that, I think people would completely lose oh, their yeah. shit on that. Sure. Yeah, but not in a good way. In, in a go fuck this place kind of way. In, 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 in a let's burn it down, Pookie kind of way. Uh, I don't think they care about the women's briefcase all that much. You know, I mean, let's be honest. The SmackDown roster consists. The women's roster on SmackDown consists of five or six women. If people think no, about I, it, you consist of five or six women. I mean, just think about for the next four weeks, who else is Dewdrop and Eva Marie going to fight? Other than Dana and Mandy, 
and uh, um, they're not going to fight Natty and Tamina, obviously. So you got Dana and Mandy. Why not? You, got, you have Naomi. <laughs> you, you know, you, there's only like three, four women. Asuka, you know, Charlotte, Rhea Ripley. That's it. That's that's all you got. That's all you got. So, you, so you're going to see if they keep putting Dewdrop out there, you're probably going to see either Naomi or Asuka over and over and over and over and over because there is nobody else right now. Everything changes in in about four weeks. Well, you got to just, I, I'll be honest with you. I actually like tonight's Raw very much. Really? I really, look, you wow. know why I say that? You know why I say that? I printed my results today so I could have the chat room a little bit bigger. Much love to everybody who's tuning in live right now. If you get a moment, we would appreciate if you give the show a thumbs up while you do that. I got to welcome all our new subscribers. Yesterday's yeah. recap, I can't. T I, I looked at, at the analytics today. I don't know what it was, but YouTube recommended that fucking video 10 times more than anything that I have recently done. I don't know what it was, but I saw about 40, 42 new subscribers yesterday just from that recap. And uh, we're inching closer to 20,000. So much love, everybody. Much love. But coming out of today, now each Money in the Bank match has eight participants. Eight men, eight women. So if you come out of today's Raw, these are the men in the, on the Money in the Bank side so far. Ricochet, Morrison, Riddle. Next week, it's going to be McIntyre, Orton, and AJ Styles in a second chance match. And whoever wins that match goes into Money in the Bank as well. There's a possibility, I doubt it, but there's always that possibility they may do another match with Jinder and Jeff Hardy and you know, the, the other wrestlers who are complaining in the back also. I mean, they're obviously going to get something you know, the, the, you don't complain on Raw, and then it leads to nothing. Um, but on the, the men's side, I tell you, tonight it felt like the people who should have won, won, and the people who should have lost, lost. I didn't want to see Shayna Baszler or Nia Jax in the women's Money in the Bank match. I actually don't mind Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. You don't think Shayna deserves that spot in the sun to be put into the main event officially? Because I think Shayna, Shayna's losing steam, man. Yeah, well, and you know what? what? I don't know why WWE is doing this, and I, I brought it up yesterday. If anybody looks at Nia, Shayna, fuck Reginald. Nothing personal against the guy, but seriously. I Like I said yesterday, Alexa Bliss, please. Alexa Bliss, you know, outside. I got to go in my toolbox. Outside. Please, Alexa Bliss, right now, you know, as they're taking a part of the ring and Reginald walks by the ring, I forgot my shoes. Just Alexa Bliss, just just ringside, just just have somebody like 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 the bad scene in Naked Gun, pick it up, and then just go like this. This way Reginald's like, hey, you got my shoes? And just character-wise, we don't really want him to get hurt. Right. You know? Uh, right. Or let his shoes explode when he goes to the top rope. But you look at the last three weeks, Alexa Bliss, Nia, and Shayna. Has Nia or Shayna benefited over the last three weeks? No. Not, they have benefited zero in the last three weeks. So to have Shayna win money in the bank in oh, the midst of I, all of this, I don't like that at all. I think Shayna... Alt, though I, I look I see people already saying like she sucks she's she can't get over dude they threw her in a fucking match with a doll they've done everything they could they have her in the middle of this love triangle with Naya and and, and black Sheamus <laughs> I, I'm just, dude I, I am so done with her being embarrassed Shayna is not a person that should be in the middle of these silly gimmicks and stuff like that matter of fact one of the positives about Shayna was that she was so bland and so career focused. She was like the Terminator. That doesn't she fit the WWE that, narrative, though. Well, why in the hell are you going to try and turn her into a fucking clown? That's the worst thing you could do. I don't understand why they're okay with having her come up to the main roster 
under the narrative of being a badass, and then as soon as she comes up to the main roster as a badass, they do everything they can to embarrass her from that spot. I'll tell you of why I think they did it. Over. She's in goofy fucking storylines. I'll tell you why I think they did it. I think they did that similar to Asuka. Asuka, and I'm not trying to compare Shayna Baszler's ability to Asuka, but Asuka, when she came to the main roster, was so up here as far as her ability. The WWE realized at some point, it's got to be, everyone hear me out. It's, it's got, at some point, it's got to look believable that people could beat Asuka. So Carmella got the rights. I know the WrestleMania, Charlotte, Asuka, but I'm saying Carmella got the rights to beat Asuka numerous times. And they did it under dumb circumstances. James Ellsworth, James Ellsworth under a mask, in a cage, this, this, and that. So they had to do dumb shit to bring Asuka down to earth a little bit and try to even Why? the playing field. So Shayna Why? Baszler, let me get to Shayna. Shayna Baszler. No, 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 no. Let's pause there for a second because I want to go back to this because we've talked about this before. Why did they have to bring Asuka down to Carmella's level? Why are you bringing anyone? Because Carmella up? didn't have enough talent at that time to go anywhere remotely up to Asuka's level. So then that wouldn't be Asuka's problem. That sounds like a Carmella problem. Right. But why, why are you taking talent and purposely stifling it in order to make bad talent not seem as bad? Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand You're it, but at that time... aspect of your money... Because people were paying for Asuka, people were merchandising and, and getting into Asuka's merch and everything. Why would you take all of that away? Why would you take away that push? Why would you take away that fire that she had with the fans in order to elevate someone that nobody gave a shit about and still doesn't give a shit I about? I understand. Well, right? that's, that's why you do it with Carmella. You don't do it with someone else who is talented, but it's so off balance that you feel like you're just forcing, you know, the, the, this. Nobody felt that Carmella was getting better when she was beating Oscar a couple of times. That's why James Ellsworth was the wild card. After everything was done, Carmella, at that time, she's improved substantially since then, but at that time, Carmella just, you know, lucked out on a lot of the matches. So you wouldn't do that with more established women on that roster, and you're certainly not going to put James Ellsworth with any of the other women. So with Shayna Baszler, Shayna Baszler was never pushed on the level of Asuka. But Shayna Baszler, with her background, the ace of spades, and being the fighter that she is, she could kick the shit out of me, you, and anybody else tuning in. And with some of her moves... Anybody that she faces, it's over in five seconds. So how do you bring Shayna Baszler down you where don't. it looks like... Yeah, right, but you see, they tried to... What you just said about Asuka and someone, having someone else than Carmella, they tried doing that with Shayna Baszler. They tried doing that with, with Dana Asuka. Brooke. They tried it with Asuka. Dana Brooke. The closest they got with Asuka was Asuka and Charlotte. Right. No, no, I know. Well, Charlotte... I think it's better than Oscar because of the talking. But here, just here, here's my point. We talked about Carmella being the one that was used to try to bring Oscar down, you know, a little bit so there's a more even playing field. With Shayna Baszler, they tried to bring Shayna Baszler down on the playing field a little bit when she fought Liv Morgan, when she fought Dana Brooke. And Dana Brooke, and I remember clearly everybody saying, how the fuck does Dana Brooke get all his offense in on Shayna Baszler? And everybody online was ripping it to pieces. They could not buy into the fact that somebody like Dana Brooke, you know, gets that much offense on Shayna Baszler. Dana Brooke didn't have an Ellsworth for a uh, clusterfuck, you know, backdoor win. You know, it was, so now they're doing, instead of James Ellsworth around, no. you got voodoo. And Alexa yeah, Bliss is Carmella, and Voodoo is James Ellsworth. You're taking the whole reason that Shayna Baszler even has a fan base and even has a job, and you're throwing it out the window for people that don't deserve to have a job. Shayna Baszler is one of my that favorites is, on that roster. 
I absolutely then why love the Shayna Baszler. Why do you want her to be lower than a Dana Brooke? Why would you want, want her to be lower than an Alexa Bliss? I don't Voodoo. consider her lower. But WWE wants that suspension of disbelief that anybody in the roster could be Shayna Baszler. And it's very hard to do, so they had to do it with Voodoo. But they never did it, though. Do you see what I mean? It I would be it. one thing if they gave... No, they didn't. It, it would be one thing if they gave Shayna like a year... And like she went through everybody, and they're like, "Okay, we got to bring her down because nobody can beat Shayna." They didn't give Shayna shit. They didn't give her shit. NXT, yes, but on the main roster, she didn't get shit. Yeah, Psycho, uh, Psycho, in there. Psycho, I love your thinking. I seriously, I'm not mocking him. I I love your thinking. Well, bring everybody up to Shayna's level. That's not that easy when you have a weekly episodic TV show, and people are not developing. Do you realize how many years Dana Brooke has been on TV? And I don't mean to single her out, but you start realizing how many years she's been on TV. And it's still, you know, unfortunately, There's some a problem with the formula, DT. Yeah, I, you're right. Formula, if the formula is taking talented people and hiding their talents so that untalented people can look like they're talented, there is a problem with the formula. Exactly. They need to fix the roster then if this is the formula that wwe uses when they find guys like keith lee or alistair black and they're too talented for the people in the room that they're wrestling with so the only thing they can do is make them hide their talents or make them go away so that untalented people can be focused on there is a problem with the formula because wwe is more character driven than match quality uh, and if you notice that almost everybody you out have both. You don't have to have just all characters, and you don't have to have just all MMA stars. Like I'm not saying I'm not arguing wrong. with you. I agree with you. Well, I know you're not. I know tell you're that not, to it's... a billion dollar company who's thick headed. See, that's the thing. But that's could... not how they always did things, though. DT. I know. I know. They didn't always do shit like that. And I'm not even going. Well, back in the Attitude Era, I mean, even ten years ago, they didn't do that shit. What, what changed? What changed that they have such little faith in people that are actually talented that actually garner attention from social media versus people that we look at and go, ah, I can't wait till they're off TV? I'll give you the answer. The, the age that we're in, in, we're in now, with technology, the internet, computers, everything is instant gratification. I'm not, we're not trying to talk old shit now, but this is, this is the point. Mish and I kind of talked about this last week on Patreon when we were talking about records. You know, long time ago, when you saw wrestling on TV, there were only, you know, there was many fewer pay-per-views a year. So you would have storylines develop much, much slower you wanted to anticipate like what was going on with other federations. You didn't have access to TV. You had to wait once a month for a magazine to try to get information. Now, uh, these days, you know, you, you know, I'm not trying to be disgusting, but you know, you're lonely and you're kind of in the mood. You just type a couple of digits. You don't have to pay an OnlyFans. You could go on, you know, a, a website, check out a couple of eye candy things and blah, 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 it's over. You know, oh, you want to, you, you know, you want to get some information about the virus. You want to get information about this. You want to know the score of a baseball game. You know, blah, blah, blah. You have it in five seconds. When it comes to WWE and it being, you know, weekly episodic and there's information and everybody out there is a critic every second of every minute of the day, they can't do the slow burn on a, on a lot of people. Okay, they can, okay. You're, that's a good point. Let me throw this out there. You're right. Everybody's a critic, and I totally understand that. But you know where the proof lies, DT? Taking a look at your ratings, taking a look at your engagement. And I'm not saying your global engagement because obviously WWE has a far greater global engagement in 2021 than they even did in 2010. What I'm saying is take a look at your engagement from your audience, and you weigh that out. You survey that. What were you doing positive in 2010? What were you doing positive in 2005 that you're not doing today? Why was there more people invested in your product 15 years ago 
than today. What is the problem? What things have changed? So if you you've see? made changes to your company and you deem them as positive, but your company is not showing the same results, especially through social media, because, I mean, even back in 2005, we had fucking MySpace, and you, you're damn well right that there was fans on MySpace critiquing the product. So when you look at it like that, you have to sit there and weigh out then versus now. And I don't see why a company would not take the information that they have and see the mistakes that they're making because this formula, this formula of taking fucking losers and bringing them up to the levels of talented people is garbage. It is right. a bad formula. Then I ask you this before I do that too, before I forget, cross my mind sure. before Dominic McGlynn, happy birthday, my friend. He is a longtime friend and supporter of the shows. I think his birthday is coming up. In a couple of days, Dominic, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, much love to uh, my friend KD. It's his uh, 32nd birthday. Oh, KD, too. happy birthday. Yeah, absolutely. KD, good friend of the family as well. Sure. Um, that's why I want to see what NWA does with their women's division. I want to see what kind of ratings they get when they're on, if they get a TV deal. I want to see what kind of pay-per-view buys. Now, that 400 stuff, like I said last week, that's bullshit. That was just a small regional portion. They didn't have all the numbers in, you know. So, But it still was a disappointing number. Because NWA right now, you know, we've talked about it before. They're not offering any of their items for free. And the only people that are going to pay for every minute, and you can't just say, oh, it's only $4 a month or it's $5 a month. That's not the point. NWA right. is charging people to view everything that they're viewing right now. Now, that will change. But when you have this women's division developed the way it does, or if Ring of Honor develops the women's division, or AEW, AEW could have a much more powerful women's division right now if they actually scouted, you know, a women from various feds across the globe and not just the Japanese promotions that Kenny Omega frequents, and not just some of these promotions, you know, affiliated with Dustin School or this place or, the, or friends of this. You know, if you, if you notice, you know, what was that, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? And I'm not trying to diss on the women up and coming in AEW. There's some women, a couple of years from now, they, they're going to be some players, big players there. But if you look at a hell of a lot of women, that perform an AEW dark, and you do get the occasional person that makes one appearance, but if you look at a lot of women that are used, it's almost like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. It's six degrees of a, a, a Rhodes school. You know, whether it's Cody or uh, Dustin or Houdet, like you could always tie them in some way back to one of those schools. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of smart because obviously they know all across, you know, who they're dealing with because they came to those schools. They know the potential. But you look at these feds in Texas, you look at feds in California, you look at Jersey, you look at a lot of these women. I mean, I started following a lot of people in the last two weeks on social media. I'm looking at a lot of these female wrestlers and I'm looking at clips of this and that and I'm like, holy shit. I mean, nobody is paying attention to these names and you don't see AEW like really pulling for these other you know people it just seems that it's very focused on one and why is that why is that it shouldn't be that WWE is the be all end all as far as the way the women's wrestling should be but a lot of these other promotions don't seem to be doing that formula either it seems they're all doing something Everybody. similar yeah, everybody has their own formulas. Like there are definitely certain feds out there that have completely different, you know, vast differences in their formula of how they push people. AEW is doing a absolutely different formula than WWE. But with that said, of course people are going to look at WWE. It's the biggest company. Nobody nobody's paying attention to number 3. Nobody's paying attention to number four. Now, I'm not talking about the fans. I'm talking about overall as far as who's going to be next. People are looking to WWE. WWE, if WWE becomes popular, and I know Joe can attest popular. to this. I'm sure you could even attest to this too. When WWE is popular, indies get popular. Smaller feds benefit 
from the popularity of WWE. AEW benefits from the popularity of WWE. It's not a secret. If people want to see wrestling and WWE is doing something right and people flock to WWE, there's going to be people, more people that flock to AEW. There's going to be more people that flock to Impact. There's going to be more people that flock to their local indie fans. That's just how it works. So when WWE is suffering, everybody is suffering. So the big reason why you have a lot of diehards for AEW is because they want that formula to change. And I understand it. I totally understand it. WWE has been dropping the ball for a minute now. This past Sunday thing that was on television is a great example of that. But the reality is, is that's why people will always pay attention to WWE, DT, yeah. is because they matter so much to everybody else. But, you know, you bring up some awesome points. A lot of people in the chat room bringing up some great points, awesome points too. Thing is, though, is that none of us work for WWE. And, um, you know, we can have the perfect scenarios, but you're telling a company that is set on their ways, character-driven, you know, they, okay, you know, people want to, you know, focus on Mickey James, giving more opportunity to women. Sure. Mish and I brought it up last week. Have you noticed in the last two weeks, ever since that statement from Mickey James, that the number of women's matches have gone up in WWE? but not necessarily the women's matches that you all want. So WWE is going to play the game, but at the end of the day, they know the formula they're going to use, and they ain't changing it. And until someone seriously shows, and that's why, like I said, it's no disrespect on women, but I will say it, you know, for the foreseeable future. The reason why WWE never did a women's only cable show is because if the ratings are horrendous and it shows that women's wrestling is nowhere near as popular as the male wrestlers, that is a knife in the heart of a lot of women's wrestlers on that roster because they're being told from Stephanie, from a lot of people out there, that, you know, women's wrestling 50-50 as the men. And I've said before, I don't mind watching an all-women's WWE show if the women are entertaining me more than the men. I mean, if you're, whoever is entertaining me, I don't care what sex you are. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. But at the end of the day, I did, you know, when there was a report not too long ago that WWE knows that, you know, the women are. Look how they dismantled their women's tag team division. Go look at their women's tag team division. If it was doing so great, why would you dismantle it to next to nothing? And they you don't brought immediately it out at a weird time too. Let's be honest. When they brought those uh, out, we were, out, we weren't ready. Three for weeks that. away from twenty thousand fans, sixteen thousand fans, seventy thousand fans, eighteen thousand fans, twenty. I mean, even before COVID, the house shows six thousand, thirty-one hundred, twenty-eight hundred, sixty-two hundred 3,100, 2,800, 6,200 for Aurora or SmackDown. So, you know, it doesn't feel like they're building on it. We're getting right by to, to live fans, and they're taken away. Yes, Becky Lynch will be back. Yes, we hear rumors of some call-ups also. And by the way, speaking of call-ups, uh, I tried to beat Crazy Cruiserweight. I guess we could segue a little bit. I tried to beat Crazy Cruiserweight uh, from actually posting this, but he beat me to it. Everyone, go check out those main event results from Crazy Cruiserweight. And if you want a pictorial of it, there you go. There you go. There you go. On the left, that is Karrion Cross defeating Shelton Benjamin on main event. And on the right, that is Bronson Reed beating Drew Gulak on main event. WWE decided to put them on TV to give a little bit of an extra rub for NXT. So people thinking that they're going to be called up in the immediate future, uh, I think are just, it's, that's premature ejaculation. Um, this was designed to give a little bit more publicity for NXT. No reason why they can't do this once in a while. I'm a little bit surprised that they waited this long to do it. Um, I want to see Karrion Cross versus Shelton. I mean, I just hope the match is just not three minutes long. 
Something tells me these matches are like three or four minutes long. So, but what do you think about that? Them putting some NXT. Uh, you can you could go. I'll put the picture back up. That's fine. Now, what do you think about uh, WWE using some NXT talent on main event? I think it's about time. I mean, a lot of these NXT guys need to be brought back up. Must it? Oh, I thought you were smoking. Yeah. <laughs> um, they need to be brought back up into the main fold. You need new people to come up on the roster. I've been talking about this for a while, and I'm going to keep at it. This is the rebuilding time. Right now is the time before SummerSlam that WWE starts introducing new characters, bringing back people, and starting to rebuild new feuds and storylines in order to emphasize on what's going to take place from SummerSlam on. I think that's really what this is. So the fact that they're bringing guys from NXT onto main event is only a positive and probably what you're going to see in the future on Raws and SmackDowns. Absolutely. Go Puff. <laughs> right. I, I have the that's almost like the big red x that's 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 all right i can I'll, I'll i can't i can't adjust this, this position but um look i like it i like it mix it up a little bit i mean let's see you know a couple of nxt stars once in a while make an appearance on main event um i think that's a great idea uh i think just some need to be a, a little bit patient because like i said even if you put bronson reed on the main roster um i don't know you know where he fits in carrying cross you put him on the main roster i know there's some people out there that think oh my god he should go up against roman reigns let him go up against jesus christ who's the savior of the world you know what i mean like you know not in wwe's eyes it's not happening yet carrying cross they own last week was the first time that they truly gave this guy some direction all right he was getting no reaction some weeks from the people at capital wrestling say can you imagine in front of 18 times? you mean to tell me that the capital wrestling center has their hands on their asses for carrying cross but if he debuts on smackdown or raw that eighteen thousand people are gonna erupt and go fall and pray for and what happens when they don't what happens when they don't i am one of those that you start a project, you build on it, you have a beautiful final product, and that's when you decide to take it to another level. There is absolutely no reason to rush carrying across right now or anybody else. Have right. him make an appearance once in a while. You know, we had that Saudi Arabia incident, the delay, and we had all those NXT stars show up on SmackDown. It was one of our favorite SmackDowns of recent memory. Did those NXT stars stay on SmackDown or every week? No. No. We got a treat. And once in a while, there's nothing wrong with getting a little bit of a treat, whether it's main event or Raw or SmackDown. Bring a guy up. Some people may forget. I mean, there were mostly squash matches, but in the very beginning of COVID, you had a couple of the lower-end NXT stars competing on Raw, getting squashed by Angel Garza or Andrade or whoever else. When Seth Rollins was with Murphy and even uh, Austin Theory, which a lot of people may forget. There was a, some cameos. So I like it. I like it. Um, AS7607, Dewdrop is the most god-awful name she's ever heard. And Nikki Cross looks like a Dollar Tree Mighty Molly. It's horrible. Ouch. That is rough. I mean, look at... Look at Piper Naveen's reaction when Eva Marie says, her name is Dewdrop. Dewdrop. Now, if you look at Piper, she does have a little bit of Drew uh, or Dew dropping huh. from her right under her left, her right eye. You know, there is a little Dew on the face, but Dewdrop. Why would you do this? Is it just Eva Marie, you know, belittling, you know, someone... I mean, that's what it feels like. It feels like Eva Marie is belittling someone who is not as beautiful as her, not as perfect as her. You know, Eva Marie is showing that she's not a role model like she said in the promos. She even said last week she was getting a manicure and a pedicure in Hachu. I caught a cold, so I couldn't wrestle. So does it... Is it just me or does it feel like Eva Marie does not have any long-term deal with WWE? I mean, I don't know. 
what her deal is to begin with. I mean, is it just here to introduce Piper Navin to the world? Like, I, I'm not really sure. The way that they initially put her out there, her vignettes, you kind of had this feeling like she was going to step back into the ring. She was going to take this WWE ambassador role. She was going to be a heroine to girls in, in the world everywhere. And they didn't do anything even remotely that they promised in the vignettes. Like the vignettes are completely worthless now because there's no correlation to her character. She just came out with another wrestler underneath her same name. That's all that happened. No, I don't even know if Piper Devin is supposed to be one of the young students that Eva Marie trained over the years. Like I have <laughs> no understanding what the fuck Piper Nevin is doing with Eva Marie? Yeah, where they did she find her? Going. That was they a protege. Protege from where? Already issues between them, so I don't know, dude. I just hope we don't get something where she is—I don't want to say a servant, because that just sounds terrible. But I'm wondering if they're gonna go with where Eva Marie, like, she is like like, uh, like a gopher for Eva Marie, like an assistant, that Eva Marie is paying Piper to be her assistant. Do this. Pick up that. Do this. Remember, you, what, you know, you worked for me. Or, you know what I mean? Like, things like that. That's why I have a feeling next week we may get something where she is reminded who who butters her bread, if anybody knows that expression. And you know what? Wouldn't be surprised if we get a return tag match next week, and this time around, Eva Marie drops down, do drops down, and walks off and leaves Piper or do drop in the ring to get her ass kicked. I don't think Piper should get pinned this early, but, it, but something tells me that something may happen to Dewdrop next week as a way for Eva to put her in a place for not listening to her boss. That's what it feels like. Sure. Uh, I just, I don't know. I'm just left with, you know, I... Did you ever talk about uh, what, when John Cena's going to come back after he did that interview with... Uh... Oh, your friend. Gosh, uh, Van Valet. No. What did he say? No, basically, John Cena said he's definitely coming back, but oh, he yeah. didn't really give me a time when. So I was kind of curious. Have you kind of got a feeling of when John Cena should return to WWE? Or And he said it was going to be this year. So I thought SummerSlam. Yeah. I think SummerSlam, 70,000 people. It's going to be treated like a WrestleMania. I think Roman Reigns versus John Cena is a good possibility. I mean, John Cena could go up against anybody. Um, sure. But I think John Cena for SummerSlam should be the way to go. Um, I don't want it to be a surprise either. I want it to be advertised. It it's going to be. A, you think it's going to be? I mean, because he's not even letting the cat out of the bag. No, no. I so mean, if it was SummerSlam, I, mean, I would think that they're, they're yeah, I, I know what you mean. You want to plan so that there's more people in attendance. Well, they're going to sell no matter what. I mean, they already well, sold that, like thirty or 40,000 tickets. They're going to sell no matter what, so why not make John Cena a surprise? Because it would be pretty cool to talk about, you know, the and you know what? I think if he takes on, let's say, Roman Reigns, I think we would like to see a couple of weeks build. I brought it up yesterday that there is history with Cena and Rey Mysterio. So maybe something happens where John Cena, you know, comes back and, confronts Roman Reigns for the stuff that he's doing. Um, yeah. The only thing is, we got money in the bank. That's kind of the obstacle. And, um, you know, once money in the bank is over, you know, we're back to live fans. I wouldn't be surprised if that SmackDown after money in the bank, you know, there's a possibility that maybe Cena does return. I mean, it's very possible. But I think Cena has to be at SummerSlam. It's going to be the biggest event of the year. You have 70,000 people paying prime, prime money to be there. 
And there's going to be crazy-ass merchandise. There's going to be so much shit going down. There's going to be so much money to be made there. He's got to be at Summer at SummerSlam. I think it's got to be. And as far as Brock Lesnar, King of Games 405, I don't know about Brock winning Money in the Bank. That would be the ultimate troll job on WWE's part. I don't see it. I don't see, I mean, it would be pretty funny to see Brock with the briefcase again and how he handled it the last time around, which was hilarious. Right. I just don't see that. I don't, I, I, I haven't decided yet who I think on the men's side is going to win money in the bank. Hell, we don't even know all the participants. We don't even know who's on right. the SmackDown side yet. Um, if Sammy well, don't Zane, you kind of have the feeling, don't you get, I mean, especially after tonight, don't you have the feeling that Riddle, and Randy are going to definitely be in the Money in the Bank. That's I think Randy that. Orton, next week it's Randy versus AJ versus Drew. I think that's the third part. This is, 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 yeah, I, think, okay. I think Drew, isn't next week, everyone, isn't it Drew versus AJ versus Randy for the second chance? Um, that doesn't, no, I think that is right because Drew lost to Riddle, and I think, yeah, Drew is right. the third person. I think Orton goes in out of the three. AJ Styles is a tag team champion. He doesn't need right. to be a money. AJ's got his own thing going with almost. He doesn't need to be split from that. Keep yeah. AJ with almost. So that puts him out. And putting Drew back in. Ah. Yeah, I see Randy Orton because it's all every man for himself. Randy will turn on Riddle, every man for himself. We'll probably see Randy Orton hit him with the RKO. Before even money in the bank. So, yeah, I think Randy is one of them. But once we have all the participants, I will tell you who I think. I personally, I tell you, I mean, I, I honestly never thought that Sami Zayn, especially a year ago, and I got so upset at some of his comments during COVID, but um, I never thought that I would be as big of a fan as I am right now for Sami Zayn. I personally think he should win money in the bank. If he is it, I mean, that's pitch. I want that on a shirt. Seriously, I want that in my backdrop. backdrop. I mean, that's just fucking hilarious, that pose of him. It's just, that's the look I look like when my fiance gets out of the shower. That's what it looks like. When I get my, you know, my super chat check, that's the look on my face, you know? So, but um, I if Sami Zayn's in money in the bank, I almost feel like I'd like to see Sami Zayn get it. But Brock and the Money in the Bank match, I don't feel that right now. I don't feel it. I think Brock is probably better if he's going to be utilized. SummerSlam, Survivor Series, the, the, yeah. the Raw after SummerSlam. We'll see. We'll see. But I don't think Brock would be part of that. Um, One more super chat, and then we'll just fill in the blanks from Raw tonight, and then we'll call it. Herbert Doherty, part of the issue is wrestling is not providing an escape anymore. Too many real-world issues going on right now. And, well, the Breakfast Soup show is a better watch. Um, I still think wrestling is an escape. Wrestling's still an escape for me. I mean, you know, I bring this up all the time, and so does Mish. You know, we watch WWE. We watch AEW. We watch NWA. We watch Impact Wrestling. We watch a little bit of MLW. We awesome. watch New Japan. You watch a lot of women's wrestling from other promotions. You watch a lot of different promotions. I watch a lot of reality TV, too. Yeah, you watch a lot of reality TV, too. But as far as wrestling goes, there's a lot of wrestling out there. You know, it's just that because WWE and AEW gives the most interactive conversation on social media. That is why people always focus on those two. You know, when you hear wrestling fans, especially podcasters out there that say, I hate Raw right now. I hate AEW. SmackDown I could tolerate a little bit, but wrestling sucks right now. All we got is Roman Reigns and everything else sucks. Well, why don't you give these other feds a chance? Because if they tweet, oh, my God, I saw, you know, blah, 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 you know, and when nobody 
reacts to it and it gets no attention, well, that kind of sucked. Like, people are more concerned about having conversations about topics of wrestling than actually just watching wrestling and enjoying it. That's why I said about the main event stuff. You know, people were losing their shit about Jeff Hardy versus, you know, Ali and some of the other matches, Ricochet and Ali. And, you know, once people were made aware of these matches, they still didn't go out of their way to watch it because, oh, if it's not on Raw, I'm not watching anything. So... I still consider wrestling as escape. You know, it's not as good as it used to be, but it's still an escape. Sure. So, but, um, but you know, but I agree with Herbert in the sense that there's a lot of people out there who do not find wrestling as an enough of as an escape. And it is difficult because there are a lot of serious real-world issues out there, you know, that you have to pay attention to. But they're not popular to talk about. Right. You know, I mean, somebody posted earlier, DT, your reaction about some area in Florida having like more cases. I'll up your ante, Missouri. Their COVID positive cases went up 59%. And they're mostly this new variant that everybody's talking about, but it's also mostly young people who did not get vaccinated. You know, and I use the analogy even though I totally respect anybody out there that never that didn't or prefers not to get vaccinated, you have to be extra careful. You got to be extra careful. It's just like I, I compare it to intercourse. You are are sleeping with a partner, and it's got to be a female because of pregnancy. This that's where I'm going with this. You're sleeping with a female, and she's not on any birth control, and you're not using any birth control. You know, you got to be a pregnant. little bit extra careful. To avoid a pregnancy, and if you're not extra careful, you don't want to. You don't want to wear anything. I'd compare that to I don't want to be vaccinated. Okay, no problem. Then you got to be extra, extra careful. Otherwise, you have a higher chance of something happening. So when you hear about these people getting it and they didn't get vaccinated, you know, what do you expect to happen? You know what I mean? Like if you go out and party and with a whole bunch of people and you're not vaccinated and there's this variant that's much more catchy and you get it, what do you, what do you think? I mean, why should anybody be shocked? So, no. No. I don't know. So, but, you know, it is what it is. So anyway, but look, everybody, at least we got this to look forward to next week. What's that? You why know are we getting this strap match? Seriously, why can't this just go away? I he mean, was the I, honestly, I think Jackson Riker was the highlight tonight for me. Really? Uh, okay. The direction of his character. He's got the savage eye. They're really playing into the fact that this guy suffers from some kind of PTSD and he's a little crazy. And when he was out there with Mansoor tonight, and having the little uh, uh, advice uh, promo, I thought it was pretty good. And I thought the reasons that he wants to fucking put him in a strap match because it's music to his ears, I thought that was good. Jackson Riker cut a good promo tonight. Jackson Riker's change from being Elias' little butt boy is fantastic. I like this direction. There's more to the character than he's ever had before. He seems evil enough. He seems to be carrying himself well. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to be anything, but I was pretty impressed. I had a good time. I enjoyed watching that little back-and-forth exchange. And then Ali was there. So <laughs> I like Mansoor, but that acting was terrible. Hey, man, I oh, want to get your advice. Being, I like Ooh. Mansoor. Okay, Mansoor didn't deliver the best promo, but Mansoor was kind of only there in order to get Jackson Riker right, to, to be say what he character. said. Right. Right. Well, Jackson Riker also planted the seed, basically telling Mansoor, don't trust Ali. Right. That's really what it what it is too. Um I just man, I look I have looked beyond the stuff from Jackson Riker in the past you know, which got him in a lot of social media trouble. I think everybody is deserves a chance to redeem themselves. And um, 
but just as a regular WWE fan, maybe going this PTSD route, that might be the only way to go with him. Because I've never, I'm not going to lie, I've never taken the time to really research and really dissect Jackson Riker's background. I know about his military and I know all that. But I've never researched or bothered to look to see if this guy's done interviews and revealed that he has PTSD or he has some things going on or things still haunt him from, you know, work, you know, serving in our military. And I would not be surprised if this might have a little bit of reality mixed in there. And I tell you, if it ends up that this guy does have some effects from fighting in the war, be really interesting to see how social media would treat that. Because if the guy served our country and has some issues, you know, and you still want to fry him for some of the things he said, you know, that that would be interesting to see how social media would react to that. Me, I look at it more like I'm a fucking wrestling fan. Entertain me and we're good. You know what I mean? So this thing where he's slapping himself. I thought that was great, too. That's some PTSD shit right there. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me even like, I don't want to compare him to like Mick Foley, but, you know, there's been some wrestlers in the past, I got to take my glasses off for this, where, you know, during the match, you would see Mick Foley go like this, like punching himself in the head, you know, and uh, some wrestlers do that to try to like rile themselves up. Right. So I'm curious to see what they do with Jackson Riker. Sure. Get live fans back. That's going to be I like interesting. It. it makes sense. Former servicemen, perhaps they can play off of that with the PTSD. And him strapping himself might be some kind of a way to keep himself in check. It also shows a bit of masochism. It also shows that he's a bit unhinged. It's a character that's believable. That's something that we're not getting a lot of in WWE. It's, and of all places to get it from Jackson Riker, too, somewhere you don't expect this to come from, but it makes sense. Everything checks out. So It's, it's weird sometimes. It's odd of what gives people a rush. And Jackson Riker hitting himself with the belt gives him this rush, this sure. adrenaline rush. I can't, I'm not comparing the two, but when I think of that, I always think back to the story that I've told before. When 9-11 hit, at the time I had a 19-foot bow rider, little tiny boat, bow rider, Google what it looks like, small, 1984 Sea Ray bow rider. And when 9-11 hit, the next day, my f friend Kenny, God rest his soul, he called me up. He said, you want to go fishing? Let's get our minds off of everything. I'm like, yeah, we'll go fishing. He's like, all right, I'm going to have Jesse come down too. My friend Jesse used to work for EMS. He was the asshole that, you know, because I don't like gory stuff anymore. I liked gory stuff when I was a kid, but I don't like it as I got older. And he worked for EMS, and his job was to take pictures at all of the scenes of accidents and deaths and stuff. And one time we went camping. And we were sitting by the fire. I have I have footage of this on a video. I just haven't transferred it online. You all, well, people who care, I will stream it on a Thursday night in the very near future. Um, you'll see yours truly from 25 years ago on camping tapes. But what he would do is we went on a camping trip once to Bear Mountain in New York. And he's like, oh, you just want to see some really cool photos from my wedding? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he brings over the book. I open the book. And here's a guy that got run over by a car and his eyes popped out of his head and his brains. He was, he was all photos that he took of all these accidents. He had doubles. He brought a photo album of all tragic shit. Somebody committing suicide over a building and just taking pictures of the street. 
shaky. So anyway, long story short, day after 9-11, we're going to go fishing. So I go to my boat. My friend Kenny and Jesse are there waiting for me. They have no fishing poles. So I'm like, what's going on? It's like, oh, we thought of something else. You want to take a drive with your boat to where, you know, the, the towers went down? Now, we've gone far before, but it never went that far, like, to where. The, so, like, we don't have to go close, but go near this. So it's like, all right. So anyway, I'm going to get through all the, I'm not going to bring up all the other dramatic shit, but the bottom line is, is that the weather, the, the waters were rough. We almost ran out of gas. We got right near the Statue of Liberty, and the Coast Guard flashes a light on us. They're like, you, they wanted to know who we were. And they put in this big microphone, you got to turn back, you got to turn back. So anyway, I turned back, and I end up getting lost. And I, we have, there's no, nothing in sight. My friend Kenny is crying. I'm about to cry. I think that we're going to just get stranded in the middle of nowhere. And here's my friend Jesse in the back of the boat. He's like, oh, this is great. This is an adventure. This is awesome. And the water is like going in everybody's face. We have the engine off so we don't burn gas. And this fucking guy loved every minute of it. About a half hour later, we finally see like a light from a boat, like in the near, like real distance. And my friend Kenny's like, just follow it. And I went. And sure enough, we found our way and we got home. But that was the scariest, scariest time in my entire life. More scary than some of, you know, somebody pulling a gun on me and other shit. That was the scariest I ever felt. And my friend Jesse just loved every minute of it. Just weird things that give people this high, an emotional high, an adrenaline rush. And Jackson Riker, you know, something tells me it ain't ending with just the, sl the slap of the belt. We might see Jackson Riker. I'm not saying he's going to take a knife and, like, draw blood or anything like that. But something tells me that Jackson Riker is going to keep hurting himself or one step below hurting himself. Almost like, almost, I might, I might have just hit onto something. What do you think the possibility of Jackson Riker doing little subtle things to himself also because he feels that he sh des deserves um, punishment for some of his well, past discretion. Well, Jackson turns into a cutter, and he comes out with his, his uh, inner thigh all cut up and his wrists all cut up. I'm pretty sure that'll get shut down off a of TV. No, I don't mean quick. cut, but I'm just saying, like, what if he just does a couple of things? Like, he feels he should... he he should be punished. Like he is punishing himself because of past action and discretion. He's not work. gonna say what they were. It won't work. It won't work. It'll trigger so? it'll fucking trigger people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, he's hurting himself because of the way he feels Good. He's depressed. Oh yeah. Oh uh, I yeah, you're right. You're right. It's just an idea. Just an Dude, idea. the idea of the PTSD is one thing, and and I know that we have a donation from near where he's very upset by the idea of this being PTSD. And I understand what he means. I mean, yeah. my old man was in Vietnam flying fucking baby Hueys around with a 50 cal and uh, has a body car, uh, has a fucking body count that he fucking remembers, you know, and you don't have to really say much about Vietnam to know it sucked. And for him as a senior citizen, still dealing with shit that happened 40, 50 years ago to, or 40 years ago, you know, it's, yeah, it's fucked up. So PTSD is absolutely a real thing. I totally empathize with that. But I, I see. I want to sit there and say, well, WWE can do this in a in a classy way, and make it interesting. And I'm and then I'm realizing I'm talking about WWE doing something classy. So yeah, you're probably right, Nir. It's probably going to turn out if this has anything to do with PTSD, this could turn out really, really negative in the press. So it's almost like how they changed Nikki Cross's character a while back. And I'll give you the perfect one. Who am I? Who am Sad. I? Sad. No, I'll, get, Sad. I'll give you a hint. Female. Kamala? Oh. Uh, hmm. I'm, my arms and my, 
are like strapped to myself and I can't move. Tony Deville. Oh, Tamina. Andy Rose. When Tamina was trying to do that, she lost, flipped her noodle, and they were gonna put like put her in the insane thing, and they didn't want to do mental like health. Were, it looked more like you were covering your. Chest. I was hugging I was myself. Gonna, I was hugging New Jack. By the way, yeah, but it looked like one of the New Jack tribute shirts. I thought you were gonna be what's her name, Peyton Rice, there for a second. Oh, that no. was Tamina. Remember when they were gonna do that? She was doing that character online, and they're like, "No, no, no we're not doing mental health stuff." Right. So yeah, if I, you can't get away with it. This probably isn't the direction that Jackson Riker is going to go. You're probably right. Near, you probably don't have anything to worry about. Actually, you know what? Yeah, actually, near. I think we could settle on it. I don't think they'll go to PS PTSD route. I think they'll go with mental health. I don't think they'll do that. I, don't, they I may think not they're say just going to forget about it, and we're just going to move on. Vince is going to have that revised banned words list. That, yeah. that revised list. You cannot say strap. You cannot say uh, heel. You cannot say face. You cannot say mental health. So that'll probably be the banned words on the list. Ah, the, this is the after effect. We talked about this last night. Expected to see some massive uh, after effects from those Singapore cane shots last night. That is my back. That is my back. That is my neck, my back, my my neck, my back, my forearms, oh, and my crack. No, that oh, is Drew McIntyre. That's Drew McIntyre. Guy's a, guy's a beast, man. Not only did he fucking fight tonight, but Bobby Lashley has a Hell in a Cell match. Yes. Um, Last time, Monday Night Raw had a Hell in a Cell match. I don't remember the date. It was August, I think August 24th, 1998. And yes, I did look it up before. I'm not Rain Man that I could remember the actual date. I did look it up earlier. Uh, it was Kane versus Mankind, Hell in a Cell. It only went about seven minutes. And it ended up in a clusterfuck. Undertaker got involved. Steve Austin, I think, got involved. But a little extra. The same night that the last time Hell in a Cell had a match on Monday Night Raw. You know what the main event was for that night? What's that, TT? The Brawl for All final of oh, Bart Gunn knocking out Bradshaw. Same night that the last time we had Hell in a Cell on Raw was the night where Bart Gunn knocked out Bradshaw. Just for anybody that's interested. Yeah. I know we're jumping back and forth. That's how we do these. You know, we don't have to go in match order. But um, let's go with the Hell in the Cell first because the match that you and I talked about for the last bunch of weeks is happening. And Money in the Bank, it's going to be Kofi Kingston versus Bobby Lashley for the WWE Championship. Mm -hmm. Tonight, Xavier Woods cutting a really cool promo at the very beginning of the show. You know, interrupting Lashley and MVP and the ladies having a little champagne toast. And um, Kofi makes the challenge for money in a bank. Bobby Lashley accepts. And um, it ends up that we have Xavier Woods versus Bobby Lashley. No title on the line, but hell in a cell tonight. What did you think about that match? It was a good match. It was a good back and forth. It actually told an interesting story. Xavier is not a guy that uh, is in the same range as Bobby Lashley, but he did a good job. Honestly, the main event wasn't horrible. It's probably another one of the highlights of the night, but overall I was not a fan of, of Raw tonight. But the main event was good. It was fun. And, of course, Bobby Lashley won. He had to win. That would have been really, really fucking awkward if Woods won. So, yeah. And I like the fact that they made an embarrassment of him. You know, he was throwing it up in Kofi's face. Kofi had to watch his boy get his shit kicked in, you know? You're well a clown. Told. Early, uh, every time MVP tried to interrupt Xavier Woods, he's like, shut up, shut up. But then MVP, because we had Kofi around ringside, we had MVP around ringside, and, um, you know, obviously very audible with the mics and uh, done by design, obviously, and... Just MVP keep constantly calling Xavier Woods a clown, a clown. 
And I love Jimmy Smith's comment tonight that a clown with a sink with a kendo stick still hurts, which is true. Yeah. He may be a clown, but he had the kendo stick in his hand, and that still hurts. I thought it was a fun Hell in a Cell match. I mean, I think the outcome was very predictable. Sure. Um, you know, I like the extra beatdown afterwards, which kind of intensifies, like, Kofi. You know, it almost reminds me of that, was that Rocky IV, where, where like, Kofi, like, sees his fallen friend, you know, and... Bobby Lashley is like, Draga, I must break you. You know, it's well, just a, the storyline because now they're using Xavier Woods, getting the shit kicked out of him in order to fuel Kofi to go after Bobby right. Lashley. It makes sense. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if Kofi finally gets a hold of like MVP and fucks up MVP as a message to Bobby Lashley. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you got two guys down and now you've built up a feud between Bobby Lashley and Kofi Kingston. So. Yeah, it's fine. It's good. It was exactly what it needed to be. And Bobby Lashley did a good job tonight of kind of regaining his savage role, something that uh, it's kind of been going on and off for a little bit, but I thought that was part of the storyline with the, the women and the money and everything else like that that's been going on for Bobby Lashley. So it was nice to see him out there as savage Bobby Lashley again because that's what I want to see in the ring. I just, Bobby Lashley needs to retain being a savage out there, being a psycho out there, and then – being a fucking pretty boy and a, and a rich guy and, you know, like the superstar athlete on the outside of it, you know, playing up the money. So it works for him, and it's yeah. doing a good job. And at the same time, you have people like Kofi that feel that he doesn't deserve that shot. There you go. Now there's a feud, you know. Bobby Lashley got back on my radar the final six months of his Impact Wrestling career. That's when I really took notice. I'm like, okay. You know, like, he was always talented. But, you know, when they did the stuff with Trump and Vince and the shaving in the head, like, I don't know. It was just still felt like something was miss missing. Like, he didn't have it all together. But in the final six to nine months of his Impact Wrestling career, and I was really paying attention to his matches, I'm like, okay, he's there's something going on here. Like, it just really, really good. And, yes, they did some dumb shit on... WWE television with the Lana stuff and the sex and Lashley, Lashley. But once they got past all that and it was down to business and they have they they formed the Hurt Business. By the way, Lashley in an interview said last week that Vince told him that eventually he wants they want to reform the Hurt Business, which I don't believe. I'm not saying Lashley lied, but I think just Vince said that to Lashley just to make him feel good. But Oh, I'd like it, honestly. Yeah. It was a good. It was a good stable. It was broken up too early. If they can figure out a way to put everybody back together, they they need to do it. Yeah. So, Lashley, I'm impressed with. He he's fun to watch now. It's just I'm really, I pay close attention to his ring presence, the counters, the guy. He's not, you know, perfect, but. You know, very credible, legit heavyweight champion. And now, right. the way he's going, if Rock Lesnar returns, I maybe they have multiple matches. But the first match, I want to see Lashley come out on top. I want Lashley Absolutely. to beat Lesnar. Absolutely. Brock Lesnar, at this point, doesn't need the title in order to advance his career. He's not coming back to WWE to get another title run. Like, he'll probably get one in order to help put somebody else over. Bobby Lashley would benefit from be not only beating Brock Lesnar, but making a statement with Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar has records that people will never beat. He took out Undertaker. That's all he needs to say. That was Brock Les Lesnar's big claim to fame. It really was. More than his matches, more than his, you know, his history and everything else like that. The biggest thing that he'll always hold is that at WrestleMania, he took out The Undertaker. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like his mark in history is done. He doesn't need any more marks in history. He doesn't need any more records to hold. He has a permanent place in WWE history. So if Brock Lesnar, and when Brock Lesnar comes back, putting him in the limelight with somebody like Bobby Lashley makes perfect sense. And I know people are bored 
of Brock Lesnar, but Brock Lesnar still has value. I want to see him back this year. You know, I understand, you know, and I've said this, the last five months of this year for wrestling fans, put it this way. If you don't still complain during these five months from July to December, then you I don't think people are wrestling fans. Like, the amount of shit that's going to go down and returns and swerves and just really going all out to just, you know, kick the shit out of what we just went through for 18 months, 19 months as, a re- as even wrestling fans. And it's not just WWE that's planning some special shit. But um, I understand you want to save, I hate to use this term, but some of your bullets for next year. So maybe Lesnar is brought in towards the latter part of the year and that builds up to something for Mania. Personally, I don't think The Rock is needed for this year. I think you save The Rock for next year. For Mania, yeah. Of yeah, course. Mania. So, you know, Lesnar, I'd be fine either way, but I do admit that I'd like to see Lesnar versus Lashley. And I think that's something that WWE, I think, would really like to do. So we will see. We'll see. Um, Absolutely. Other than that match tonight, everything else was Money in the Bank qualifying matches, which I thought was a really good way to go tonight because Money in the Bank is in four weeks. um, And you want to have the two ladder matches pretty much set with at least two weeks to go so at least you could make some subplots, some sub-storylines develop with that. And remember, there's other matches that are going to take place as well. We don't even know who Roman Reigns' opponent is going to be at Money in the Bank. Everybody's talking about SummerSlam. Oh, you got to think about Money in the Bank too. You know, we got to see where that storyline goes. Um, there's a lot of other championship belts that need to be addressed as well. One one match that was made tonight for Money in the Bank. I don't know how you feel about it, but I think we kind of expected this to happen. Charlotte will get another opportunity against Rhea Ripley. Of course. <laughs> of course. I know a lot of people were bitching about that tonight. It was it was a bad match last night with those two. Um, Rhea's not doing it. She's not doing it. Whatever she had in NXT did not transfer over to the main roster. Her character's all over the place. She doesn't make sense. Charlotte is... They're trying to make Charlotte look weaker than her, and it's not working. Charlotte is clearly yeah. just just ahead above her. You know, like, Rhea's not even in the same class as Charlotte. So we're going to keep going with this. We're going to keep throwing our head up against the wall. Hopefully fans start biting on Rhea, or eventually she's going to turn into... Nikki Cross's larvae sister or something. So, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, Adam Pierce and Sonya Deville being that quick, you know, to give Charlotte another match because uh, Rhea intentionally disqualified herself yesterday using the top of that table thing. I don't know. I just, like I said, WWE... Yeah. They made the big mistake because Charlotte was in was not in Mania that they made Rhea Ripley play the role of Charlotte. And that's not what they should have done. And I don't think anybody could play the role of Charlotte. But Charlotte's no. got another opportunity. What happens after money in the bank? I don't know. I yeah. really don't know. Yeah, they're not, they're not grooming anybody. It doesn't seem like anybody else is in the picture. I, I imagine Asuka might come back. And do something, you know what I mean? Like Oscar's quickly becoming main event Dolph Ziggler, so she's just there to fill in the gaps until WWE figures out who to put the belt on. You know, yeah. Um, I think the Rhea project is is a, is a failure so far. I mean, yeah, sure you can salvage it in different ways, but this direction she's going, nobody believes he's har- she's hardcore. Her her gimmick feels very painted on. Um, no pun intended. You know, her wrestling in the ring with Charlotte has been 
one match is good, one match is meh. Yeah. Like they are really hot and cold with their matches. You know, one minute you're kind of excited and you see fucking Rhea pop Charlotte in the nose. And it's like, oh shit, this is some good stuff, you know? And then the next minute you get, well, we, whatever the crap was that we saw last night, where it ended up with a DQ because of, uh, of the table flip or whatever the fuck that was. It was garbage, dude. It was bad. It was, it was bad from two people that you expect to do better. Charlotte is a vet. She's a vet. She should be able to pull out a decent match out of Rhea. And Rhea is a fucking blue chipper. And you expect her to have decent matches at the beginning of her career in the main roster. So this is a complete clusterfuck on different levels. I know, you know, we've talked about WWE dismantling the women's tag team division. But I think... WWE dismantling the women's tag team division is showing is wreaking its ugly head in this feud with Charlotte and Rhea. And what I mean by that is, again, when I bring up the women's rosters on Raw and on SmackDown, these rosters contain five to six women. So everything is focused around Rhea Ripley and Charlotte, and you're trying to have this feud spread two to three months. And in the process, these women have to wrestle other women. And the only other women that they can actually wrestle is Asuka, Naomi, Nia, uh, Nia, well, they're not going to go with Nia Jackson, Shayna Baszler. They could actually now, but it seems like all they really could vote face is Nikki Cross, yeah, Asuka, Nikki. Naomi, Dana Brooke, Mandy. That's it. I mean, how many maybe, times do you want to... Marie, even Marie, or Dewdrop. <laughs> I, yeah. see. I don't know. You know. That would be interesting to see Dewdrop... You know, Piper taking on Rhea or Shaw. I think that would actually be interesting. But the point is, they don't have a nice roster where you could... That's why, like I say, the Nikki Cross thing never felt that she was getting a push. It felt like she was the cog that was needed in the wheel that well, was dude, built that's why for I the say, feud. That's why I say the tag team division is not necessary. It was a stupid idea. I, I know you've defended it a few times, but... It's a, the right amount of women to have a comprehensive women's division, a women's belt division. As far as throwing the tag teams in there, you're complicating things. You're literally taking away from both rosters, both, both runs for both titles, and now both sides suffer. You have a singles division that's pretty much tapped out because whoever can be a singles is probably wrestling in the tag division. The women's tag division needs to go. That... That idea was unnecessary. Fucking unnecessary. If they didn't have the women's tag division, I think things would be a lot different because you have a lot more people to cycle through. It's just not necessary. It, they don't have enough women to do that. The, when WWE should have brought the tag division was when they were still weighing out the idea if they should have a TV show for the women's roster. But, man, that tag division... Having Nia tied up, having Bliss tied up, having Shayna tied up, having Mandy and Natalia and all these other people tied up and Dana. It's like, stop it. It's not fucking necessary. You, you need to stop with these tandem tag teams that make no fucking sense. Naomi switches partners like people fucking change underwear. I, I just, it, it's not good. It's not helping anyone. And if they, if Charlotte and Rhea had more people to wrestle against, you could build storylines down the road. You could create new feuds while finishing out this feud. And you could still have this feud go on for months, but you don't have to go back to back to back because you could stutter it. You could have different matches. You can have one month where Charlotte's going up against somebody in, in, in for Raw, and then the next month where Rhea's going up against somebody for Raw, and then the next month after that you can have Charlotte and Rhea back at each other again. But now that you have to sit there and split all the talent up from a small singles roster into a tinier tag team division stupid man i wonder so, how many times oscar wrestles in some capacity against Rhea or charlotte in the next four weeks i think it yeah. happens at least once or twice yeah. i just i see that a mile away because 
you know, even for Charlotte, you know, nothing against the other women, but I, something tells me Charlotte not too keen about wanting to face like a Dana Brooke or a Mandy Rose or a Nia Jax. Shayna Baszler, I don't know how that would actually, you know, given enough time, but it's a mess. It's a mess. Dude, so all the, it's the problem. The other problem is too, because you have this tag division and the singles division at the same time, you're creating more losers than you are actual believable, believable wrestlers. There are more losers in the women's division because they have to put people in the losing spot in order to make other people go over than you have winners. So the only winners right now are Charlotte, Rhea, Nia Jax, and Alexa Bliss, maybe. That's it. Those are your winners. Everybody else is a fucking loser. And it's horrible. It's horrible that it's being booked this way, dude. Yeah. The uh, Money in the Bank matches that we had tonight, Ricochet over AJ Styles. Um, you know, like like you said before, AJ Styles is a tag team champion. They had the Viking Raiders, you know, show up, take Omos at a ringside, distracts AJ Styles. We had a couple of fruit roll-ups tonight as well. What a horrible way yesterday to end two well, end one feud with a fruit roll-up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's just ridiculous. But yeah, um, Cesaro too. Yeah. yeah, Cesaro also fruit roll up. But um, you know, Ricochet advances, which is awesome. Like I, I agree with you. I think Randy Orton advances in the second chance match next week. Uh Morrison beating Randy Orton. You know, Miz was at ringside. Miz hits the drip stick, you know, splashes the cold water, which probably Randy Orton probably was like, thank you. <laughs> you know, having a hot match in that building and getting some cool water splashed in your face, I think you actually like that. But, um, you know, Miz interferes. Riddle comes to ringside to try to help out. That was funny with Riddle on the scooter and right. Miz with the wheel. I'm like... Joey 924, man. Joey 924. And me with the bus in the background. Don't run me over. But um, Riddle causes distraction, so Randy Orton loses. Randy Orton not too thrilled about it. Later on in the night, Riddle beats Drew McIntyre. Didn't Riddle beat Drew McIntyre with the fruit roll-up? Yes. He beat him with a fruit roll-up also. And we don't, we're not focused on Drew. But Randy Orton was down the rampway watching the match. And all we had for an awkward 45 seconds is, you know, Riddle. And it almost reminded me of the dog thing. Riddle's like, come on, Randy. Come on, right. Randy. And he's showing him the RK bro mug. Come on, Randy. I, what did he want? Fist bump? Come on, bro. We're bros. Come on. He didn't Randy. want to get his ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. If I was Randy, I think, I, I think Riddle is perpetually trying to keep his ass from getting kicked from Randy Orton. Like, even their promo together, when he was talking about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we both ended up in the money in the bank? And he kept pushing it, and you could see Randy's buttons getting pushed. And Riddle almost acts like an innocent child, maybe a petulant child, I'm not sure, depending on your viewpoint, but... He almost acts like he needs Randy's approval. So that's why he keeps pushing and pushing and pushing because he doesn't want Randy to turn on him, but at the same time he needs his approval. That's the gimmick. It it works. It's funny seeing Randy Orton in the father role, but it works. Much love, Jay Carlos. Wow. Thank you very much, my friend. That's Yen, by the way, Mish. That's Yen. That's not... No, <laughs> no Jay Carlos... Thank you, as always, yeah, my friend. You know, I always try to re repay in some way, shape, or form, but that's very generous of you. Thank you very much. And I kind of feel bad. You know, you didn't even ask, like, a question that you want us to talk about, but I thank you. He loves our work, obviously. And, uh, oh, shit, man. Thank yeah, you so much. Dude. That's, that's awesome, man. That's fucking insane, bro. Like, yeah. I really appreciate the hell out of no, that. He helped thing. me get another chair. You know, I mean, right. I can't model the chair, but, you know, he got helped me get another chair. And thank you very much, my friend. That was very, very generous of you. 
You know, right. for the haters out there, I'm going to leave that shit up for the rest of the show. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate it, Carlos. Um, thank you, Carlos. I'm, I'm taken back by that. I, I, and all of you out there that support everything that we do, still blown away by it. Absolutely awesome. Um, I can't thank you all enough for everything. I mean, it's really, you know, I never in a million years ever thought I would be doing literally six shows a week. And, uh, you know, e even the idea of adding another one or two, if I could tighten the ship a little bit and spread it out more even. And, uh, you know, we've only just hit the surface. And um, now I'm messing around with plugins. So the audio, now my focus more than anything is audio quality. Even when we do video, like making sure that our levels are exact, then we're going to start playing around with, ec you know, like manipulating voice and stuff. And I'm going to do some presets. So maybe we could try to like make our voices sound like some specific wrestlers. I have some things planned. We're working on it. Yes. Everyone in the chat says Jay Carlos is the man without a doubt. Thank you, Thank you again, man. Um, Ricochet, you know, I wouldn't mind Ricochet getting a briefcase, but you know what I mean? It almost feels like, yeah, all right, he is the high flyer. He will be the one taking some crazy ass bumps. You know, in the end, is he really going to get any push out of this? I don't know. But like I said, one thing I will take away from Raw tonight is that it seemed like everybody who should have won, won. Alexa Bliss and Mighty Nikki, you know, maybe maybe some people are kind of eh about that, but then again, would you rather uh, Nikki and Alexa advance or Nia and Shayna advance? Some right. tells me that the Nia factor might be the reason why they would not rule in that, in that direction. But we had Naomi and Asuka, Beating Eva Marie and Dewdrop. This was pretty much nothing. Um, we think Eva Marie and Oscar are going to kick off the match. Eva Marie immediately tags herself out. Dewdrop does all the work. And Dewdrop, was, I guess, was going to try to hit a finisher or something. And Eva tags herself in, thinking that she's going to get the three. And obviously, her opponent kicks out. And Eva Marie wants to immediately tag right out kind of reminds you of was it drake maverick when he was managing aop like he would mm. just like run in to try to get the tag right. and then run right out we've seen uh, people over the years do that a lot but eva tries to immediately tag do drop do drop li literally drops down from the ring right. even marie's like the fuck you doing i want to tag you in i can't do this and Another fucking fruit roll-up. I, I just realized how many goddamn fruit roll-ups we got tonight. You'd have a sugar rush with all the fruit roll-ups tonight. Right. So um, Naomi and Oscar advance. I think everybody was pleasantly surprised with that. Because like we said when we opened up the show, I don't think you would have had Eva Marie and Alexa Bliss go to Money in the Bank. Um, and speaking of Alexa Bliss and Nikki, and if you're tuning in a little bit late today, and you didn't see Nikki's new look. That is Nikki's new look. I'll take that off for a second. So everybody could take it in. She is the butterfly superhero. She is the butterfly. Yeah. Yep. I got my larvae in Scotland. I can't lose. I got my larvae. My larvae. My la I like Nikki Cross. I hope this goes somewhere. We talked about it at nauseam earlier. But at least she gets to go to Money in the Bank. My question is, are we going to see Alexa and Nikki almost act like they have a little bit of a friendship and a bond leading up to Money in the Bank? And then at Money in the Bank, there's where Lily makes her appearance. Yeah, That's what I think is going to happen. Um, so we already talked about Riddle over McIntyre. Morrison over Randy Orton, Naomi and Oscar over Eva Marie and Dewdrop, Ricochet over AJ Styles, Alexa over Nikki Cross, and um, I think wow. that's it as far as the matches, right? 
Yeah, yeah. that's everybody as far as the matches go. Um, I tell you, of all the matches tonight, I think Ricochet and AJ Styles was my favorite other than Hell in the Cell. But yeah, Hell in the Cell's I'm a little surprised that you were not feeling that much of Raw. Time. I think this was no. one of the better Raws of the year. Wow. Yeah, no, I would definitely disagree with that. Um, <laughs> I mean, with the exception of, you know. I'm already burnt out for, for the night because of Sunday. Sunday was really lousy. It was a very, very bad, uh, probably the worst pay-per-view of the year out of all the pay-per-views, not just WWE. Yesterday was the drizzling shits. Mm -hmm. So going into tonight to see what the aftermath of it was didn't surprise me that we got more Ray and Charlotte. Didn't surprise me that you know there was really nothing to kind of like go forward from there. So Jackson Riker was a highlight. The main event was great. That's really all I'm taking home with me. You know you what know? was cool? A uh, little tidbit that they mentioned tonight, and I did a, some research, and it's true. Tonight was the first time ever, I think first time ever, that John Morrison and Randy Orton wrestled each other in a one-on-one -on -one match. How crazy yeah. is that? Yeah, They've cool. wrestled in, you know, where you had like four ways, I think six ways. But this is the first time I looked up Johnny Nitro. I looked up John Morrison. Could not find a one-on-one -on -one match against them in the past. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, shout out to everybody who is tuning in on the other outlets, Facebook, sure. Twitch. Twitch is dead for me. I realize unless I got big bazoomas and I'm in an inflatable pool writing everybody's names on Not ducks. Anymore. Amaranth and all those other girls, they got they got pulled. So they Oh, really? The yeah, the hot tub streamers had their own category, and then they started doing some uh, – they weren't making enough money in their own category because sponsors didn't want to cover them. So they started going back to the ASMR stuff and doing like mock blow jobs on air and uh, they got kicked. So Twitch find them or suspended them or something, but yeah, they have to go back to their hole. Unbelievable, man. So Unbelievable. It's about time. That's, it's about fucking yeah, time. That, that I mean, fun. Everybody's been trying to. I got so many DMs and emails from people out there, or my our friends out there, saying, "DT, play some games," you know. And I'm like, "Come on!" I, I I mean, don't get me wrong. There's some games I'd love to play, but a lot of these games that everybody plays, I would be the drizzling shits in. And people out there like, "No, man, you know, play and suck at it." And people will get it. I mean, wouldn't people want to hear me complain? And but um. Yeah, I just can't get into the the games and this stuff. So I think the Twitch, I'll I'll keep the channel around, but as of right now, I mean that channel is not really meant for us to do shows, and I'm not going to do podcast in an inflatable pool. So right. we'll not do that. Even though I did do one hotline episode back in the day of the Minority Report in my parents' pool, they actually called me up and I was in the pool on a cell phone. And I even think I have that episode. So you, do you know I was going through an old hard drive over the weekend? I found an episode in a Mass Maniac show where it was the Mass Maniac, Joe, Joey 924, and Black Moses. They hosted it. Oh, okay. I, I never, ever remembered ever those two guys doing a show with the Mass Maniac. One episode. I don't know where the hell it came from, but that was pretty crazy. But, wow. uh, you know... Just to wrap up pretty much the show, and I know we ran late, you know, and as far as you know, calls kind of got nixed tonight, but we did calls yesterday. I would do them Thursday again, and we got all week to talk about stuff. But uh, sure. the reason why I enjoyed Raw tonight was some storylines furthered. You know, Kofi and Bobby Lashley, we got clarity almost immediately. Um, you know, some of the other feuds that are in, in the making is going to happen. We have half the entries in Money in the Bank already. We'll have the other half probably by Friday. Expect loads of qualifying matches on Friday. Mm. And, um, you know, with the exception of, you know, Nikki's outfit and Dewdrop's name, but I think that name is just going to be temporary, hopefully. Right. Um, her reaction to it, I don't know if I posted this picture before, but that was her reaction 
when Eva Marie called the dewdrop. Yeah, that's pretty bad, dude. Yeah, and um, you're not going to oh believe this, God. Mish. Yeah, Mish is not going to believe this, but if you thought that super chat from Jay Carlos was awesome, yeah, go check out this one. Guy's working. He's balling. He's balling. Much much love, my friend. Fucking hell. Thank That's you, awesome, Jake. man. Seriously, Amazon Prime Day. I know where I, what I'm doing. I want to get one of those sous V's or whatever. I, no, I'm going to... I don't know if we deserve that. No, I don't know if we deserve it. Well, you know what? I try to give back you know, privately in some ways. So uh, I don't I don't recall some of the things that I've given to Jay Collis in return, but you know I always return in some capacity. Thank you. I don't rig contests though, so Jay Collis I can't rig a contest, but he knows that I will return it in some capacity. So much love, my friend. Thank you, and that's what we try to do. We try to keep this as an escape for everyone out there. You know, we I think we're very very fair when we talk about stuff. I mean tonight. Mish and I disagreed on a lot of topics. You know, sure. we don't complain about everything. We praise a lot of stuff, you know, but we offer our criticism when needed. And the one thing I truly believe that separates what we do, and even Mish and Joey do the same thing also, when we criticize things, we offer solutions. And that's the difference between a lot of shows out there. You know, you'll just hear people rip AEW or rip raw or rip particular wrestlers, but you notice the only solution that they'll come up with is go to catering or release them. That's not a solution. You know, anybody out there could, you know, complain about stuff, but if you don't come up with a solution, you know, anybody could do that. So, uh, you know, we appreciate that. And we try to keep it real, man. We try to keep it real. I mean, some of the things that we talk about are not, the most popular stuff, but you know that it's pretty honest. I mean, you know, some of the things that we say, you know, some people get really, really upset at, and, uh, you know, you always get authenticity from all of us. But um, with that said, we're going to start wrapping this up. Before we go, this was something that I noticed quite a few of you have been asking all throughout the night in the chat, and I have sort of an answer on my end. Mitch, did you see the China, I don't even want to call it yes. documentary, that China piece on Vice? That was, uh, that was interesting. We were actually watching it um, in, the, uh, in the old Discord. Somebody had it up in there, and we were all watching it bef uh, before the pre-show last night. And uh, it was, it was, it's, it's disturbing. It's pretty, it's pretty gross. You know, the, the producer or the director is gross. Her manager is gross. I mean, these people all took turns on her. They exploited everything they could with her. It really shows the dark side of being a wrestling fan. Because that's what these people were. Is they were just wrestling fans that wanted to exploit her so that they could become famous. And it came off painful to watch. Some of the stuff you knew about, some of the stuff they, they purposely you know, glossed over. They didn't talk about her surreal life stuff too much. They pretty much disappeared when it came to talking about the porn. You know, they, they, they knew what they were focusing on, but a lot of this lost footage that these guys had, uh, are, are, are these guys in jail? Are they under investigation? Well, the manager, I'm pretty sure he was being investigated. See, this point. is the thing. And if people go back, if you go on my episode archives, you just type in China or Joni Lara, you'll see the episodes. I've talked to close friends of China and family members of China since she's passed. Right. There's one person in particular, if she is listening or watching, please reach out to me and let me know if I can actually, you know, elaborate a little bit more detail of what they have told me in the past, but I'll say a couple of things right now. I held back a lot back then because I was always been told, be careful with this guy, Anthony. 
very Sue happy and this, this, and that. But I compared China's death back then to Anna Nicole Smith. Addiction is a disease. It is a sickness. And when your body becomes chemically dependent on drugs, and you have enablers that exploit that, that is a sickness and that is an illness. And when China died and this guy was grabbing a lot of her possessions and refused to give it back to her immediate family and was trying to sell stuff, was trying to profit off of this. This guy was trying to re record every little thing to try to make it like, you know, uh, this controversial, like re reality show and everything. I don't mention his last name, but swear to God, man, there's not many people in this world that I want to punch in the fucking mouth. But that guy, to this day, I will say it repeatedly, I don't understand how this guy did not get arrested at all. I mean, not even just arrested, detained or something because the, the amount of drugs that this guy was able to procure and enable for her and was actually at times coaching her, uh, you know, like... Oh, it's a little, it's a, you know, just a, you, you, that's what happens when somebody's chemically dependent on it. It's just a little, it's just a, that guy is the lowest of the low. I mean, they were so desperate for attention that that's how a lot of this footage has become available. And China, Jim Cornette, uh, a very valid point too on his review about the actual documentary, the mother was kind of a scumbag, too. Yeah, the mother was a scumbag. No, they were family members that yeah. really the did not her. help her at all. I think I the not... sister was trying to be the good one. I really do. I believe that her sister genuinely, yeah. truly cared and worried about I've talked to the Joan sister before. The whole time. Yeah. But the mother, I mean, 30 years, Jim Cornette brought it up. He's like, 30 years, and you say that you can't find your daughter who's on national television? Right. I'm like, yeah, fucking Jim, you're dead on with that. Yeah. You're telling me you see her on TV twice a week, sometimes three, and you don't know where she is. You can't find a contact for her or nothing. Yeah. Like the mother made no attempt in order to get back into her own daughter's life. I, I get that there's family issues and stuff like that, but almost 30 years? Come on. And especially when she needed her mother, when she was facing addiction. Yeah. You know, how many times did you see through that documentary she's like i'm so alone well i didn't watch myself. all of it I, it got to a point about a third of the way through i turned it off i i read recaps after to see if there was anything that i should tune into but as soon as i started seeing a lot of what i was told about this guy anthony i swear to god man i believe in karma you have no idea how much i believe in karma and I truly believe that one day something absolutely terrible is going to happen to this guy. I don't wish harm like that on anybody, and I won't wish it on him either. But sooner or later, something is going to happen to that guy. And it might have nothing to do with China. But I do believe in karma, and, and one day that guy is going to get his. And, you know, honestly... I don't understand how he Dude, was not arrested. You missed, I'm blown away you by that. The worst part. The worst part was, and then this was towards the end of the actual documentary, was that Anthony guy, China turns around. She's like, you're fired. I can't deal with you. You're fired. And he turns around to her and he says, you can't fire me. I'm your soulmate. Yeah. That guy was such a manipulative piece of shit that he literally prevented China from firing him yeah. by making these pseudo claims that no one can love China more than her, than yeah. him. Yeah. That alone is probably some of the most disgusting levels of manipulation you'll see in that entire documentary because they were all they were all manipulative. They all manipulated her. That's why I I mean she she made mistakes. She made a lot of fucking mistakes. And I understand that there is a point, especially towards the end, where it gets tear-jerking 
when she's playing the violin by herself or the the cello by herself and stuff like that. And it was just the realization that her boyfriend didn't show up because oh that was that was the other thing too is that her boyfriend was supposed to show up who was the 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 cameraman the the producer or whatever because she's sleeping with everybody. And he said, yeah, I didn't bother showing up on the day that she died because I was too busy doing heroin. So I just made it seem like I was sick. And it's like he saved the voicemail. That guy, Anthony, saved the footage of when he went into the apartment and found her dead. And he was shopping it around for a while trying to sell it. Like, this is some pretty gross fucking protocol. And I mean, I mean, they were supposed to care about her. This is not the way you treat somebody that you care about. This is the way you treat somebody who's a cash cow. Yeah, you know? it, 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 at the time it felt like a, like a, a low budget Anna Nicole Smith tragedy, but these were all fuck ups, and they saw the China's weakness and exploited it, and they thought they could make stuff off of it, and they got attention from her, and she got attention from them. And China, you know, that's why I've always said this over the years. From them? No, no. If she she actually got real attention, DT, she might have gotten some real fucking help. No, well, the attention, she wanted anybody's attention at that time. Anybody's attention. They happened to be the ones, but they also had the candy, you know, dangling over her head also. Yeah, they were doing heroin with her. They were doing pills with her. I mean, her, her, what was her COD? Oxycontin, um, a couple of different muscle relaxers. Yeah. And that was, it was a cocktail. It was a fucking drug cocktail. Yeah. And it's, I do agree with the people, you know, and her sister said that she doesn't believe that she did it intentionally. You know, she believes that she was just, it was just another day and she took too much, you know? Yeah. No, Darren, China was definitely no angel. I mean, but, you know, when, again, drug addiction is an illness it's a sickness and when drugs take over your body you know that's a that's a sickness okay here's the problem with that so i understand the whole drugs are a sickness but they made it very clear that when she was in japan for years there she got her shit together she was like a, an english teacher for japanese students like she was working she wasn't on the drugs she had uh, doctors that she went to she actually had prescribed drugs for her illnesses, for, you know, some of her mental damage and stuff like that. So she wasn't using recreational drugs in Japan, or at least that's the way that they painted it. It wasn't until she got back to America with Anthony and that other guy that they started pushing drugs on her because in accordance with the documentary, they all wanted to fuck her. Yeah. So the only way that they could fuck her was to drug drug her. Yeah. So you knew that she was an addict. She was clean in Japan, got her shit together, and then she came back to America because she was lonely in Japan. And the first thing that they did was they used the fact that she was an addict to get her drugged up so yeah. they could stick their fucking dicks in her. Yeah. It's disgusting. Dude, so bad. So it's, bad for her. It's disgusting. And I'll be honest with you. I've said this before about Vice. You know, I appreciate dark, the dark side of the ring stuff a little bit more. But the fact that they put this on in the first place. I'm very disappointed at Vice. The, this guy, Anthony, and all these enablers and everything should have all rotted and never got the opportunity. If they wanted to sell it to another, co- you know, to somebody, they should have sold it to a fellow jail cell member for a couple of cigarettes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just um, third it away and I'm like, nah, I'm done. I'm done. I just, I'm just really annoyed that they were, that they, put this together. I mean, look, it's, it was, Vince Russo truly loved her and Mick Foley was looking out for her and a lot of others. Look, but at the end, uh, the candy over, you know, takes over everything. Mick was real. Vince, is, Vince was lying. Look, they didn't show it in the documentary about the Vince Russo stuff, but I clearly remember how Vince Russo exploited China. I oh, remember I know about him. I think he put the interview on Patreon or something. Right, he put it behind a paywall, and he let the teaser out there that China's going to talk about her abuse and how she was beaten and everything else like that. But you can only listen if you pay me five dollars to listen to the Vince Russo podcast. Yeah, but dude, I've never forgotten that they didn't cover that in the documentary because why would they? 
Yeah, that's, I mean, look, that's definitely. That was scummy, dude. Yeah, that's, you know it's yeah, that's not something I would have done. You know, but there's a big difference between getting an interview. And f you know what? I, From what I understand, Vince Russo, and you got to remember this part, and then we could wrap this up and get it, and be done for tonight. You know, sure. they were working on the rebuilding of China. That's what the, this reality thing was being done. This was the rebuilding of China. It reminded me of Axel Rotten, God rest his soul. I brought this up many times before. One of the most depressing things about Axel Rotten, and I knew people who were very close friends with Axel Rotten, and they would always say how awesome Axel Rotten was. Axel Rotten was uber nice. And yeah. I met him many times, but Axel Rotten had a tremendous addiction also. And one of the saddest things was having Axel Rotten coming on to the Mass Maniac show with Maniac and I, and on three different occasions proclaiming on the show that he is now drug free. And as you're hearing him say this, you could hear his speech is a little slurred here and there, and Maniac called him out on it once or twice. But the thing is, is that what he was doing was basically looking back on it, he was trying to challenge himself that by putting that out there, now he's got to deliver. So he was doing that. With this situation with China, they were trying to put it out there that she's rebuilding. And I remember making a comment on one of my show episodes that, yeah, she filmed, I remember she filmed like a video piece, like a minute or two, and she looked great. And I had made a remark at that time that, you know, somebody said to me, as soon as the cameras ended, she did drugs. You know, so they were like trying to put this out there that no, 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 rebuilding, rebuilding, rebuilding. And that wasn't the case at all. They, they were just, it was just a lie. And she ended up fi meeting the same fate that Axel Rotten did and others. That's why I say, you know, she definitely did things she shouldn't have. She's not a saint. But when you become that chemically dependent, on drugs it is an illness it's in a sickness and when your body gets used to it you know you take one and you don't feel anything so you take another and then you got to take this you know this drug keeps you wide awake so you got to take this other drug to try to help you sleep and you got to take this other drug to wake you up again and next thing you know you know you have a tragic death happen i don't understand why this guy was not put in jail I don't understand it. It blows me away. Some of the emails that I read and some of the things that he did, right, like you said, right after she died and, you know, taking, stealing a lot of her personal belongings and hocking it and trying to, I mean, oh, I don't understand. Yeah, talk about it. You, you, oh, fuck. So the worst part, Jesus Christ, like I can, I can make this any worse, right? The worst part is when it came to her death, they cremated her, and what happened? What was supposed to happen was, um, the mother was supposed to get the ashes, and there was supposed to be some ashes kept for this China thing, this this China ceremony. Or no, it was supposed to be. There was some some ashes to go to one person, and some like the sister, and then. They were actually dumping out 75, 70, so 25 percent of the ashes was supposed to go with the mother at home. The other 75 percent of the ashes were dumped into the ocean. But Anthony lied and kept 25 percent of the ashes, and that's when he had the 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 concert, the China Death concert, where he put China in this gaudy black urn with China in purple letters. And it was like a big scream fest. And they had people come down and cheer China. Like, and he totally just took all the money from that and kept it and kept China's ashes. He kept a dead woman's ashes that he had no right to take. It was a trophy. Oh, he's a scumbag. He's, I'm telling you, man, I just, 
seriously, I don't, like I said, I don't wish harm on people. I don't, you know, but sooner or later, I look at it like this. If this guy was that much of a fuck up and the way he treated her, he's going to do it again to someone else. And the second time around when he does it, you know, he might either slip up or he may get caught or he may deal with the wrong people. And something will happen to that guy. I, I, I'm, I will not post any of the email. Like I said, if you check out some of the old episodes that I did, you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of this stuff. But, you know, the, the, the re, and the reason why some of the family members and friends reached out to me back then was because I was one of the only people, I know you did as well, that we were calling this guy Anthony out. We, I said from the beginning, it feels like the Anna Nicole Smith tragedy all over again. How the fuck is this guy not arrested, you know, and I'm sure there was an investigation, but look how many years have gone by and nothing, nothing. It just blows me away that this guy never went to jail. Horrendous. Hmm. So, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I just, um, I kind of wish that Vice didn't put that out there. I just, well, uh, it, 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 but it's out there. It is. One thing, you, one thing you realize about China also, and this is something I've said many times in the past, just because you're a celebrity doesn't mean that you don't have pain physically, emotionally, depression, bullying, harassment, loneliness. You know, those, are, those are all, and sometimes when you are very successful, the loneliness, 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 is, loneliness is even worse because you can't trust anybody. That's even worse about it. So, you know, it's just, it's really, really sad to see the way she went out. And, you know, I always felt that that interview that Steve Austin did with, with uh, I mean, with Triple H, and Triple H said he wouldn't put her in the Hall of Fame because he didn't want young people to see that she did adult films. I mean, I think that kind of spiraled her also. I mean, I, I hate to be dark about it, but it's got to be very difficult for anyone to bring up a logical case why you would put China in the WWE Hall of Fame, especially surrounding how she passed and everything else like that. I don't know. I don't know if WWE would do that anyways. Because, well, I mean, she's in and, now, but part of DX. No, but right. But I, I mean on her own, especially. So, Yeah, I don't think I... I don't think she's going to be put in on her own for several years. Maybe if social media gets loud enough and long enough, right. you know, then maybe uh, something will cave in. It's a dark story. It it's is. one of the dark stories. And you know what? It's a story, and this is what I think WWE needs to realize. It's a story that is extremely dark, and the ending, there's no alternative ending. It's not like a movie where you get the, the Blu-ray or the 4K version and there's a bonus alternative ending on there. If it's dark now, it's going to be dark five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So if I was WWE, you put her in. Because there's never going to be a time where it's, no, it's not dark. It's never going away. And I know this kind of sounds cold, but the quicker you put her in, the quicker this is not a topic anymore and it's not a repetitive discussion and it's not podcast episodes and it's not blogs and it's not tweets and it's not Facebook posts and it's not rants and it's not petitions, China and all of fame. It sounds cold, but you put her in and no one else could do that. That's why she's, I mean, she should go in for obvious reasons on a career, but there's never going to be a bright, ending to this so i think wwe should just put her in and that's it hmm. so obviously i'm gonna have to reword the title for tonight's episode because i think this china discussion was fabulous a little unexpected but since i noticed quite a few of you throughout the night saying did you guys see the china vice piece i think we definitely needed to talk about it so Sorry about the uh, the lack of calls tonight, but you know we did we did it a couple of days last week. We did it last night, Thursday, last Wednesday, Monday. So we'll do it 
calls this Thursday. The entire episode will be off and on with calls. But any final uh, comments before we call it? No, it's uh, it's twelve thirty in the morning. Time for me to fucking crash. Yeah, and die in here. Mish, much love, my friend. Thank you very much, and much love to Jake Carlos again. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, I will take care of you. You know that. So, all right, my friend. I'll right. talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Peace. Everyone, I want to thank you for tuning in tonight. Much love. And um, <laughs> Psycho, big shout out to you, my friend, as well. Uh, I'm going to get out of Yes, Charlie did not know. Mish's name is also Anthony. You got a pair of Anthonys here. So we were going to do a third po- person in the past and with someone. They, their name had to be Anthony or Tony. And we were going to call ourselves Tony, Tony, Tony. That is uh, infamous, I think, R&B group out there. So anyway, um, before I go, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Just remember the schedule for this week. Tomorrow, Mish and I will be on Patreon, 10.05 p.m. Eastern, right after NXT. You can find us on the Discord channel. For all of you out there that are a YouTube channel member, uh, I have created a Discord channel for all of us. It's a place where you can go and chat all throughout the day because I know a lot of you out there would love to chat with each other at times where I'm not doing a live show. So I, it's going to take me a couple of days to just get all the kinks out and configure it. But if you're a channel member, you'll be able to have immediate access to that Discord page. And we'll open it up to others here as well. So that is done. I just need to now just piece everything together. Wednesday, AEW is not on. By the way, I do have the AEW rating, 551,000 viewers. That's right around the number that I said on Friday. I don't remember the exact number, but I did say that they will break 500,000. So good for AEW to get 551. Um, This week they're on Saturday night. TNT, 8 to 10 p.m. A lot of you are asking me, DT, are you going to do a recap episode Saturday night? As of right now, I probably will. But I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do a watch along. Maybe we'll do one if enough of you request it. But uh, Wednesday, because AEW is not on this week, Wednesday I will be back here at 8.05 p.m. And we'll do like what we've done in the last couple of weeks. Next week they return I think back to Wednesday nights or the week after is Wednesday night. So as soon as AEW returns to Wednesdays, the Wednesday show will return to 10 5 PM. And, um, Thursday I will be here for the Don Tony show. I don't know if we're going to do another all elite feet con contest. That was hilarious last week. And, you know, we talked about it Friday, but you know, congratulations to Cody and Brandy. You know, they gave birth to their baby girl. Liberty Iris, I believe her name is. And, uh, you know, it was was pretty cool, you know, especially we did the contest the night before, all elite feet. But um, we'll do another one Thursday. I haven't decided the topic yet. But anyway, I'm going to jet out of here. Yes, this is the New Jack tribute shirt, one of a few. I have a couple. I wanted to wear it tonight because I just got uh, it, it arrived over the weekend. And, um, yeah, we're going to have a fun week. Definitely looking forward to this week. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, one final thing. If you enjoyed tonight's show. That's not the right one. What the hell? Is, oh, here it is. There we go. Like, share, subscribe. Like, share, subscribe. Yeah, I botched that beginning today. You know, a few of you like, oh, I want to see that chair shot that made you vomit, you know, that night. So, you got to see it at the beginning. But... I forgot to set it, so it would, I didn't. I know you didn't want to see 15 minutes of that footage, just the chair shot and out of here. So my apologies for the opening botch, but uh, one thing I will not botch tonight is the end. So I want to thank you all for tuning in, and uh, if you're around tomorrow, Patreon.com/slash Don Tony will be there at 10:05 p.m. And if not Wednesday, I'll be back here. 8 8.05 p.m. Jay Carlos, once again, my friend, I owe you big. I appreciate that. And all of you out there, you know, if you have any friends out there that aren't aware of the show, let them know about the show. Um, Like, share, subscribe, and uh, 
you know, we're this close to 20,000, but you know me, I won't be satisfied until we get a million. Got to go for the jugular, right? So, all right, everybody. Be well. Stay safe as always. And I'll catch you either tomorrow night on Patreon or Wednesday night right here. Good night, everybody. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. For me to live any other way was nuts. To me, those goody-good people who work shitty jobs for bum paychecks and took the subway to work every day and worried about their bills were dead. I mean, they were suckers. They had no balls. If I wanted something, I just took it. I ran everything. I paid the bills. I paid the host. I even paid the masked maniac. Everybody had their hands out. Everything was for the taking. We always called each other good fellas. You would always hear from somebody. You're gonna like Don Tony. He's all right, he's a good fella. He's one of us. But if you're part of my crew, nobody ever tells you they're gonna get rid of you. It doesn't happen that way. There weren't any arguments or curses like in the movies. See, your haters come with smiles. They come as your friends, the people who've claimed they care the most for your life. And now, now that's all over. And that's the best part. Today everything is different. There's lots of action. I don't have to wait around for everything like everyone else. Oh, I didn't get the vaccine? Fuck you, vaccine me. Oh, your delivery guy has COVID? Fuck you, feed me. Right after I moved here, I ordered egg noodles and ketchup. And I got spaghetti with meat sauce. I'm no longer an average nobody, while they get to live the rest of their lives like a bunch of schnooks.